Hello everyone and welcome to the Moe Gamer Podcast, coming at you live from quarantine, um, which as Chris and I were just discussing uh, off mic is uh, pretty much a dream come true for the pair of us. <laughs> so yes, um, as you can probably tell from that, I'm joined once again by my good friend Chris Kasky and we are of course keeping a respectful distance between the pair of us. There is at least two feet between us, uh, six feet isn't it rather, two meters. Yeah. Um, yeah, last I checked, it was uh, several thousand miles. In fact, so I think we're 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 doing social distancing right. It's okay. And even <laughs> if we were hanging out, we would probably keep six feet between us anyway because we're nerds. Yep, indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, well, how's uh, how's quarantine life been treating you then? Well, I had time to thoroughly pre- prepare notes on 12 different psycho shooters in advance of today's episode so I, fantastic i'd yes. say i've been having a worse time with my life to be completely <laughs> honest not to obviously discount or disrespect the extreme severity of what's happening in our society right now but um i feel that our people are uniquely equipped to, to come out of this with our sanity intact mainly because yes. we didn't go into it with much in the first place but yes Yes, indeed. As uh, as uh, Penny Arcade said recently, we've been preparing for this our whole lives, haven't we? So, you know. <laughs> my, my greatest fear is, I think most people's greatest fear, is that I'm probably not going to get my physical copies of FF7 Remake or uh, Sakura Wars <laughs> in a timely fashion. Yeah. But like, oh no, I've got other RPGs to play, so you'll have to excuse me if I don't get too upset over that. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. So is it, on that note, it sounds like Square Enix are, are sort of prioritizing orders from their own store and they're just going to sort of get stuff out to other retailers as and when. So yeah. th- they'll come. They just might be a bit late. So, all right. Uh, well, as, as Chris already noted there, uh, our main topic for today is going to be Psycho Shooters because we've both been playing the two Psycho Shooting Stars collections on Nintendo Switch. So that will be the main topic of our third segment today. Uh, Before that, as always, we'll be having a little look at uh, some news that has been happening, although obviously a lot of things have been very much disrupted by what's going on right now. Um, And then we'll take a moment to talk about what we've been playing recently, which I'm sure we've got plenty to talk about uh, in that section, having had plenty of free time. So, all right, let's begin with the news. So the first thing uh, you posted, I'll be honest, I haven't been keeping super on top of uh, what's been going on in news recently because i've been concentrating on sort of playing stuff and writing about it but uh, it's been weird there hasn't i always say there hasn't been much but we end up talking about it for an hour anyway yeah there's there's been indeed little little nothing like earth shattering with the exception of the nintendo direct which we can obviously yeah Yeah. muse i I think what 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 we've got because it because it's been quite a while since we uh, sort of talked about this we've got lots of sort of interesting little stories that aren't necessarily sort of super important but they're, they're quite intriguing like this first one um data west not data east data west is coming back to the video game industry with some digital re-releases and sequels um i'd never heard of this company before um but it seems that they're sort of very well regarded in the worlds of rail shooters shoot 'em ups and visual novels um their visual novels were especially popular on pc 98 fm towns and those sort of uh, proprietary japanese pcs uh, with their most famous stuff being the fourth unit in the Psychic Detective series. And um, of particular note to sort of people who, um, you know, sort of more modern gamers, uh, one of the guys who worked there part-time would go on to create 428 Shibuya Scramble, which of course was a cover game on moegamer.net a little while back. Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess you, you probably know a little bit more about Data West than I do, because you, you posted this story. So uh, yeah, what, what what can you tell me about this that i haven't already said if anything i I mean not really that's the gist of it right the the big thing is just like i've been consistently intrigued by how this continues to happen in this day and age like we Mm. saw it we saw it with the return of cotton right like a couple a couple weeks ago um and now like so these kind of obscure pc related guys are are just starting to emerge and it's, it's of particular interest to me because um uh, I'm a huge fan of the PC engine slash turbo, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And during that specific age of gaming in like the early 90s and mid 90s, um, there was quite a bit of like crossover between specifically the PC, PC engine development scene and the actual Japanese computer 
home, home yes. computer development scene. Yes. So, like, there was a lot of hybridization and crossover and porting going on. So like many of like the weird visual novels and strategy games and RPGs and stuff that were popular on the PC engine had their roots in the um, the, the home computer age. You know, East, mm. most famously, yes. right, from Falcom, that yep. uh, crossed over to the console scene because of the PC engine. So um, a lot of these guys kind of have links to that, that era, which I find just fascinating from a game history and development perspective as well as a, like a graphical perspective i find that very specific look of this era of gaming very uh <clears throat> delightful so I, I just get excited when i see these companies kind of returning to the modern sphere in some way shape or form mm. yeah definitely yeah definitely yeah it's g gonna be interesting to see uh what happens with this and and if any of it will come west for the first time because we also live in a time where stuff that historically remained confined to japan has been coming west so you never know we'll have to wait and see i guess all right uh moving on next story we've got is uh them's fighting herds uh which uh was previously uh, fighting is magic which was the my little pony fan game um that got shut down by hasbro in 2013 uh this is finally leaving early access on april the 2nd of this year uh which will introduce the first chapter of the story mode and that'll be 14.99 dollars 99 i've never actually got around to actually trying this but uh, I, I remember sort of people saying very positive things about it back when it was a my little pony fan game and i guess it's sort of continued to develop since then so it's it's good to see it's it's finally getting a a sort of full-on release yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm excited about it. It looks like <laughs> I I mean besides like my my obvious like interest as a my little pony fanboy, like I I love um I love goofy fighting games. Yeah, yeah. Like specifically fighting games where like not all the characters are human or like mm -hmm. and they're like fun as opposed to a super focus on competitive. Like I like weird stuff I can bust out at a party to like confuse yeah. people. Yeah. And like the the legacy of the connection to My Little Pony associated with this game aside, this is just a like a weird cartoony fighting game where every single character is a four legged hooved animal. Like it's cr <laughs> it's crazy weird, and like I can't wait to give it a try. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's cool. Um, and apparently Lauren Faust has actually uh, contributed uh, to some of the designs of this as well. So although yep. it's not an official My Little Pony game anymore, it has had the involvement of the creator of the Friendship is Magic series, which is awesome. Yeah, that's like make cool. no mistake, like all the characters just look like side characters from yeah My Little Pony. Like the the design is like clearly like you could squint. Yeah. And like, and like, from, and from from what I understand, what they essentially did was they they took a lot of like the programming and the sprite work they had already done on the My Little Pony game and just retrofitted it with new characters. Yeah. So like, yeah. there's char the, these characters. Many of the characters are like in spirit, personality, and everything. Like they are My Little the My Little Pony characters they were originally meant to be. They just mm -hmm. essentially skinned them. Yeah. Right, like there's a like a fun party character who like busts out of balloons and a cannon. Like, oh, like it's it it is. It's just they literally had to take the copywritten stuff out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's cool. So watch out for that on April the second. Uh, obviously, now is a good time to check out stuff like that. Uh, like I say, fourteen ninety nine, very reasonable price as well. So. All right, uh, moving on. This was just a, a little story that I haven't really followed since it was first announced, but I just thought it was uh, it was quite quite amusing. Uh, so, Reggie, formerly of Nintendo, uh, is now part of the GameStop board. Um, so his tweet was: "The gaming industry needs a healthy and vibrant GameStop. I look forward to being a part of GameStop's board and helping to make this happen." Um, so, I mean, I know there's been a lot of recent controversy over GameStop with them defining themselves as an essential service and sort of. <laughs> not <laughs> not allowing employees to go home and that sort of thing but um yeah I, I thought it was interesting to see to see reggie jump on on board with this and and see exactly where that's going to lead um like i say I, I don't have a lot more to say about that because it's uh i mean it's it's sort of business stuff that i tend not to follow but i just thought the the name attached to it would be quite interesting so yeah what is reggie doing working for gamestop <laughs> <I don't, laughs> first of all first of all i wasn't aware gamestop sold video games anymore <laughs> like I, I just thought gamestop was a place to go for funko pops and overpriced mad moxie statues yeah. like yeah. I, I wasn't aware so like i don't know what reggie's gonna bring to that <laughs> 
Like, is he just going to start stapling used Skylanders into poly bags? Like, I don't know. Because that, that's what I'm pretty sure happens if you work for games. Like, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe this will be interesting. I mean, I don't know about on your side of things, but in the, in the U.S., there's specifically been, like, a tremendous lot of discussion over, like, the nature of brick-and-mortar retail and, like, yeah, how, yeah. how we can redefine and make brick-and-mortar retail something that's still necessary for, like, the modern experience. Um, we, we saw it in the U.S., and I don't, I don't know if the Toys R Us have a presence overseas in the uk and europe i don't even know but like yeah they, all- they, they did but they've they folded now so yeah so yeah. all toys r us is closed right but like they're coming back and uh, at least in the u.s mm-hmm. um and with like an entire like essentially a revamp because the, the the idea behind what they're trying to do now is to make the idea of going to the toy store an interactive experience so it's yeah. something that can't be replicated by shopping on the internet so like, yeah. like there will be like play spaces and like interactive things where where kids can actually like experience the product mm-hmm. and that and that's how they're trying to define it so it'll be interesting to see reggie who obviously is <laughs> one of the great business minds of the industry mm-hmm. uh, I assume trying to interject some of that ethos into the way GameStop operates. Like try to try to make it a place where I want to go, not a place yeah. that I have to go whenever they have an exclusive. Because <laughs> that's the only time I step into GameStop. Yeah, exactly. I th- I, and I think this is going to be sort of the direction that that sort of retail takes for a while. This is an area where sort of Apple really innovated, because yeah. like going going to the Apple Store was always designed to be an experience, always designed to go go along there. And get some information and get some tuition and talk to people and find out that sort of thing and have a play with things and that kind of thing and i mean some people love it some people hate it but that that is sort of the real value of having a retail presence now is having those people there and able to show you things and teach you things and being able to experience things for yourself um game over here which is basically our equivalent of gamestop is following a very sort of similar trajectory to to gamestop so sort of over the last few years um i did some part-time work for them before i got my current day job i did some seasonal seasonal christmas and black friday work and back then yeah they they were sort of really ramping up things like the um the sort of shelves full of funko pops and things and 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 that sort of stuff but in sort of the last year or two i guess they're putting a lot more of an emphasis on the interactive side of things so they've they've actually got sort of little game stations where you can play things and try things out for yourself and that kind of thing so yeah it's, it's going to be very important for that kind of retailer to remain relevant somehow and sort of show that they have value beyond just being able to go on amazon and get it five quid cheaper so <laughs> um so yeah yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens with that but uh it remains to be seen and it probably won't happen for a while right now yeah but yeah uh, <laughs> i was gonna say who knows indeed what kind of ramifications this will have for any kind of yeah what's going on right now will have for any kind of retail experiences moving into the immediate future yeah exactly all right continuing on um so alongside the panzer dragoon remake uh, which at the time of recording released yesterday i think um there's also going to be a vr game developed by a company called Wildman incorporated who i'm not familiar with um but they're sort of officially licensed by sega and everything uh, and they're making a game called panzer dragoon voyage record which apparently relives each of the various episodes that appeared in panzer dragoon panzer dragoon Svi, and panzer dragoon saga um so it's going to be um a first person game in vr with um sort of motion controls where you hold the thing in your hand and it's like you're firing off the back of the dragon and um it's set to release in the 2020 japanese fiscal year so that goes right up until march 2021 and they haven't given any more specific information than that uh but yeah if they do this right this should be pretty spectacular yeah i mean the worlds of like the the pan the whole thing about panzer right is the is such an otherworldly setting so like to yeah. really be immersed in that in vr with the strange geometry and construction and the creatures and the vehicles it, it, it screams out to be one of the f- few experiences in vr i might actually actively try to get into because <laughs> it's just yeah i love yeah. panzer so much yeah definitely all right, continuing on, uh, we've got a release date for the new Shantae game. Uh, you can actually play the full thing right now on Apple Arcade, but uh, for everyone else, 
or indeed most people um <laughs> it's may the 28th um it'll uh, it'll be coming out so yeah uh so looking forward to that and limited run have also confirmed that they're going to be doing a physical release of it as well so um unfortunately it's not sort of like an unlimited one like um p cube did with uh, half genie hero but um yeah you, you will be able to get hold of a box copy of this if you want to so looking forward to that they've released a new trailer and some new stuff and yeah it looks lovely looking forward to this a great deal all right continuing on so mary skelter is set uh, sorry a third mary skelter game is set to launch in japan on august the 27th uh, and that's coming for switch and playstation 4 right away uh, rather than releasing on one and then the other so this is going to be uh, sort of the finale to the whole series um so as i've mentioned a few times before i still haven't got around to playing this at all but it i guess that it's sort of um it sort of uh, put, put, the story kind of cont is, continues on from one to the next, but they also stand by themselves. It also sounds as if um, this new version they're putting in basically the the narratives from the previous Mary Skelter games as a visual novel, yeah. um, which is cool. So because these these are pretty long games, um, they're they're like sort of hundred hours from what I understand. Um, so. Yeah, look forward to that. Uh, because I'll, again, compile heart. I'll be very surprised if this doesn't come west at this point. Oh yeah, well, uh, but like, yeah, exactly. But like most Idea Factory and compile heart stuff, it will probably be quite a while before it comes west. Uh, but if you do want to jump on the Japanese version, that'll be out on August the twenty seventh. It sounds too like mechanically, this is going to be a really cool. I mean, you know, you and I like our like our first person dungeon crawlers quite a bit. So I'm always really interested to see what companies do differently with new ones. Yeah, and uh, it yeah. sounds like this one's going to have two protagonists that are operating in. Um, tandem so like one exploring ab above yeah. the surface one exploring below and like you're going to be able to switch between them in real time like to explore the yeah. dungeons like simultaneously and like what you do in one dungeon might affect what happens in the other dungeon and you're going to be like you're going to have like a button to press to switch back and forth between them so you're going to yeah, have to like actually cool. be keeping like two dungeons in your head at the same time while you're working hmm yeah yeah sounds cool yeah, I know the, the, the previous Mary Skelter games have sort of been very mechanically um, sort of rich and people really like them for that. And there's lots of interesting stuff going on with the atmosphere and the whole nightmare thing and that kind of thing. So, yeah, like I say, one day I will get round to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As with so many things. As with so many well, things. It's not, the, the limited run pressing, right, is great because you get one and two for the Switch on, a, on the yes, same card. Yes, that's right. So. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. All right, uh, continuing on, I was very excited to see this in the recent Nintendo Direct. Um, or oh, sorry, the Nintendo Direct Mini, which they sort of stealth dropped on everyone the other day. Um, for those who remember a Nintendo DS game called uh, either Clubhouse Games or 42 All-Time Classics, depending on where you were in the world, um, they're doing a follow-up for Switch, which is called 51 Worldwide Classics. Um, and that's coming on June the 5th. And much like the previous game, it's it's all it is. It's a, it's a bunch of um, simple tabletop games uh, of various descriptions. So it includes sort of um, well-known uh, board games like backgammon and checkers or drafts and uh, dominoes and chess and that sort of thing. Go. But it also includes I'm yeah, it go, go yeah. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing is that it also includes a bunch of um sort of slightly lesser known games from around the world as well so it's got things like um sort of mancala in there and uh Karim, which is uh, i think it's indian that one um chinese checkers which is german um <laughs> and uh yeah, all sorts of interesting things in there. And also, uh, besides the sort of board games, they're also incorporating um, a bunch of things that are similar to the kinds of things you'd expect to see in uh, things like the old Wii Sports and Wii Play games. So there's, there's a bowling game in there. I mean, there's a bowling game in 42 all-time classics as well. Um, and there's um, a variation on the Tanks game that was in Wii Play as well, which was a really, really great little multiplayer game. So... This should be a lot of fun uh, for sort of party play and stuff. But 42 All-Time Classics was actually really solid for single player as well. It had lots of interesting challenges and lots of different games 
very comprehensive rules and strategies to read through as well so it was a good way of learning these games and learning how to play them effectively as well so yeah i'm really looking forward to this actually yeah, me too i never played the um you know the ds one because i just i wanted i i always wanted this conceptually as a multiplayer thing and i just didn't know mm -hmm. that many i didn't have many friends who actually had a ds and who i could also convince yeah. to buy it for the ds you know what i mean yeah. so this is great yeah. because i can bring this to the homes of people i know who have switches or bring my switch with yes. me like i can yes. really see this as being something that just travels with me to like parties and gatherings yeah um yeah and like as you as you mentioned like these are first party nintendo games like so they're developed so competently like beautiful interfaces just they're not cheap they don't feel cheap like it, it's yeah. very exciting yeah yeah the ds game had great music as well um it's not something you'd expect to say you'd expect to say about a game like this but yeah it had fantastic music <laughs> so yeah that's super cool one one really nice thing about the ds version actually is it was one of those games that supported ds download play oh, that's good so you only you only needed one cartridge to play with other people so if you knew someone who had a ds but didn't have this game you could just beam them a copy of the game you wanted to play with them out any of the games that were in the compilation uh, and you could play it with just a single cartridge which is really cool. oh, that's exciting um but obviously, if you if you can all play it together on one switch or with multiple switches and so on, then uh, yeah, that's much much better. Cool, yeah. So looking forward to that, um, and that's coming in June. Uh, next one, uh, Ninjala uh, is coming to Switch on May the twenty seventh as a free to play game. Uh, this was Gung Ho's thing that looked a bit like Splatoon, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just thought it was because um, it's not going to yeah. require a Nintendo. Uh, subscription either like it's just going to be free to play oh, online cool. all you got to do is download it and play it you don't have to even oh, have a neat. nintendo subscription yeah yeah that's cool so it's um basically a battle royale game for up to eight players um where sort of ninjas are kids and you have special powers that you can use you can sort of wall run and dash at high speeds disguise yourself and use sort of things so it sounds like this could be a potentially interesting game i mean Battle Royale is one of those genres that I, I sort of quite like in principle, but sort of none of the actual games that have released in that style really sort of appeal to me from kind of an aesthetic perspective. Yeah. Um, but sort of the, the look and feel of this one it, and the fact it's free to play, it, it, yeah, I'll probably check this one out and give it a go. I mean, uh, knowing my gaming history, I probably won't stick with it for that long, but I'll give it a go for sure, especially if it doesn't cost anything to do so. So um yeah that will be coming on may the 27th uh next up mr driller is coming back uh with mr driller drill land on nintendo switch and pc um so this is a port of a gamecube game um which is um in sort of in the same series as the re-release of katamari damashi that they did a while back mm. um so it's called the encore series in japan which makes the, the fact it's a re-release a little bit um a little bit clearer uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is on the way. Is there a date? June the twenty fifth, and that's coming for Switch and PC. Uh, and obviously, if you have a GameCube and you can track down a copy, you can play it right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah, Mister Driller was uh, was kind of cool, and uh, there was some weird um, law thing with Namco, wasn't there? Isn't he? He's like, isn't he like the son of the dude from Dig Dug or I something? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I remember researching this a while back and thinking, oh, the extended universe of Namco. <laughs> I was going to say Namco lore. Place. Namco lore is <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah, um, I've got to look this up now. I feel we've had this conversation we before. Are, we, yeah, whenever we anyway. touch on Namco, we always end up coming back to how, like, insane, like, who who Wonder Momo's aunt is or something. Like, it just, it yeah, just goes deep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, here we are. Okay, so the, the, the main character in Dig Dug is called Hori Taizo, um, which is a pun on the Japanese for I Want to Dig. Uh, and he's he's the father of Mr. Driller's protagonist uh, and the ex-husband of Baraduke's heroine. There you go. Um, so there you go. Now you know, if you didn't already, because we've talked about it before. <laughs> but there we go. Mr. Driller's coming back. Um, also coming back is uh, Shirin the Wanderer, which is coming to Switch uh, this year sometime. Uh, this is being released by Spike Chunsoft. Um, was there an English version confirmed for this? I don't know. I don't 
think there was was there i think they've just announced this for japan but yeah, spike chance must have been pretty pretty global uh over the last few I mean, years the game so, exists yeah, in been... english it's not like new translating yeah. work has to be i mean whatever new content will have to be translated but yeah the, the vita version of this came out in the west this is just a port of the vita game yeah 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 so, so that'd be cool sharing the wonder is a a, a cool sort of um it's the sort of Japanese take on roguelike mystery dungeon type thing, sort of very mechanically interesting, lots of things to do. And uh, yeah, it's sort of a, a very well regarded series that isn't called Mystery Dungeon. Um, yeah, so watch out for that. There's just not a lot of these on the Switch as of yet. So, like, I got really no. excited about it because I do love Japanese mystery dungeon games. And there's, mm -hmm. but with the exception of like those, those Toho ones. There's not a whole heck of a lot of these on the Switch, and there's the there's the Chocobo one as well, which yeah. is really good. Um, but that's yeah, again that's a, that's a port of the Wii game rather than a brand new one, I think. So, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that because the Wii one was really good. Yeah, but, it's a great um, game. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next news: we've got a release date for Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition, which is May the 29th. There's a lot of stuff coming out in May. Um, yeah, we so, shall see. So this, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so they've uh, announced sort of there's different um, sort of collector's editions around the world for this. So, and um, because of the region free nature of the Switch, you can basically order from wherever you want to get the limited edition you want. Um, so, noteworthy for sort of people who, who collect vinyls is the European version is going to have a vinyl soundtrack with it, uh, which is very nice. And then elsewhere, uh, there's art books and um, yeah. All, all sorts of other bits and pieces so be sure to have a look at all the different versions of that uh there's also going to be um sort of an add-on story in that as well that will apparently be immediately playable as well i thought that Not was pretty interesting i wasn't expecting yeah. new, new content mm. you know <laughs> yeah yeah so it remains to be seen how, how substantial that's going to be and how it sort of ties in with anything i, I assume it's going to be sort of an attempt to link things together um, because toward, towards the end of Xenoblade 2, there was um, there was sort of just some hints from the first one, weren't there? There was like a little sort of echo of stuff that was going on in the first one. And yeah, uh, yeah. So, the so indication be making... being that they were happening simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. So pre presumably it'll be something to do with that, but we'll have to wait and see until May the 29th, uh, assuming, assuming this virus doesn't mess everything up more than it has already, of course. Uh, moving on, uh, Square Enix are releasing some Final Fantasy VII retro figures that are based on the old uh, PS1 field screen models, the ones with the giant hands and no arms. Um, yeah, so <laughs> if you ever wanted low poly Cloud and Aerith and Barrett and I think there's Sephiroth and there's, uh, what's his name, Reno yeah, there yeah. as well. Look um, at them, yeah. they make me so happy. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool, that's so cool. So there's going to be eight of them all together, um, and they range from um, sort of 2.6 inches for Barrett, uh, and then there's Red 13 in there, which is 1.4 inches high, which is super cute. Uh, they're going to be $64, and they'll release in August uh, 2020, so that's $64 for all eight of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Uh, watch out for that. More stuff to cluster up your desk and shelves with. Uh <laughs> Moving on, uh, Sega has been uh, celebrating its 60th anniversary with a special website and so on. And one of the things they revealed is uh, a new ambassador character called Sega Shiro, uh, which is uh, a character who is actually portrayed by the eldest son of the guy who used to play Sega to San Sanjiro back in the uh, Sega Saturn days, uh, which is cool. Um, yeah, so rather than um, Sega to Sanjiro's kind of uh, <laughs> aggressive approach <laughs> towards promotion <laughs> the world uh, needs to, to, Sagata Sanchiro right now yeah yeah um so his, his his son is there to sort of um introduce people to Sega and 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 show them what it's all about and and, and that sort of thing it's just a, a sort of nice hop happy positive thing in uh, in these trying times so yeah, go and check out that that little video if you haven't already uh, continuing on, Inti Creates has got three new games in the works apparently, and they're going to announce them around the company's 24th anniversary on May the 8th. God, they've been around that long. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, we don't know what they are yet, um, but, 
yeah, so there's three unannounced titles. Um, and in the meantime, they're developing new content for Dragon Mark for Death. They just put out the version 3.0 patch for that recently, which has got some new characters and some significant revamps to the existing ones. So, I'm um, genuinely impressed by how much they've been supporting that game. Yeah, yeah, I, I should really play it some more. Um, Same. Because... Yeah, I, I mean, I know, I know you sort of bounced off it when you first played it, but we 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 had a pretty good good time when we played multiplayer a couple of times. So we yeah. should uh, we should give that another go, definitely. Because um, yeah, it's 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 um, really interesting to how much they've they've added to that uh, by then. And the last story we got on the list for today uh, is that uh, Mark Cerny did a. Um, a presentation on the PS5 a little while back that was originally intended to be a GDC presentation, so it was very, it was very heavy on the technical details and so on, which put a lot of people off. But um, one of the noteworthy things that he mentioned in there that promptly got misinterpreted and misreported was that um, there would be backwards compatibility for PS4 games, uh, but people assumed that uh, it would only be like a hundred of them to begin with. But they've clarified that since then. And said that the overwhelming majority of the 4,000 PS4 games will be playable on PS5. Um, I'm still a little disappointed with what they revealed with this so far. Because it yeah. still sounds like it's going to be um, sort of software based, emulation based, backwards compatibility rather than true stuff. Because yep. I know we were both super excited for the idea of a PlayStation that would play any PlayStation game. But um, I think they, they've, they've probably still got some some details up their sleeve that they haven't told us yet but at this point i'm not sure what we want is ever going to happen unfortunately i but, think they're uh, just on tempering expectations mode right now yeah 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 i think so so but either um, way it does, yeah. it does sound better than what the xbox has going on already which yeah, is they're, that, they're like weird like patched in software based emulation thing yeah yeah and i mean they, they've they've been I mean, X Xbox 360 sort of did that to a certain extent with original Xbox games. But yeah, Xbox One, you have to actually download the whole game rather than just being able to run it off the disc, which is not what I want from backward compatibility at all, especially with the sort of the limited size of hard drives these days. Um, but yeah, so uh, more news forthcoming on that. But yeah, at the very least, you'll be able to play most of the PS4 games on PS5 and hopefully... Um, maybe even bump it up to higher resolution or make them run at better frame rates and so so we shall see all right anything else you want to talk about before we move on no i think that's it okay all right let's take a short break then and then we'll come back and we'll talk about what we've been playing recently apart from psycho shooters which will form the third part of this podcast of course all right we'll see you in a moment Welcome back. For our second segment, we're going to talk about what we've been playing recently. So, uh, with our quarantine situation, we've both had plenty of time to get stuck into a few games. So, Chris, I know you've been spending a fair amount of time with the Psycho Shooter maps we're going to talk about in the third segment, but uh, is, has there been anything else on your gaming plate lately? Yeah, I finally got a chance to kind of sit down and dig my heels into uh, Level 5 Snack World. Oh, cool, yeah. Which I had been... This looking forward to for a very long time so yeah it's really really fun um it's really just um if you can imagine essentially like what if a goofy japanese anime focused developer decided to make diablo mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's kind of what snack world is yeah. um so it's basically just a dungeon crawler with a heavy emphasis on loot collection yep but it's um it's japanese developed so unlike um what we normally associate with kind of the diablo style hack and slash action rpg it's got an extremely deliberate pacing to the combat with a heavy emphasis on animation frames yep. timing um you know, an, an axe is really heavy. It swings really heavy. So there, there's a there's a great deal of physicality and and frame 
uh, you know, interest in frame study and really getting your combos and dodges down appropriately. So, like, the combat, it almost feels like a hybridization between, like, Fantasy Star Online and Diablo in that sense. All right, cool. Um, so, you go to the dungeons, you conduct various missions, you collect your loot. Um, the loot is... Um, you can equip up to six weapons at a time and then, like, cycle mm-hmm. through them. Um, each weapon... We- weapons have, like, stamina. Like, they don't break permanently, but you can only use them for so long before right. you have to switch to, to, to another one. So you always have to, like, keep that in mind with your weapons. Um, there's, like, uh, varied enemy types. Um, like, the enemies belong to, like, different families. It's not, like, elemental, but it's, like, lizard-type enemies or beast-type enemies or machine-type enemies. Right. And every and every weapon you pick up will have traits where it's, like, strong against one or two of them and weak against one or two of them. So the idea is that you have to, like, be cognizant of what type of enemies you're fighting and then be, like, switching appropriately between, like, what weapons you have equipped that are effective against them. Because the ones that are ineffective are really ineffective. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and and enemies hit pretty hard. So, like, wiping enemies clean quickly is kind of the emphasis on your strategy. Um, yeah, but it's just it's just a really good time. It's, it's brightly colored. Um, the whole point of the game is that it has, like, a really pun-focused sense of humor. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> abs- absolutely everything is a stupid pun. <laughs> and, like, and, like, and, like, enemies... Almost every enemy I've encountered so far has unique, uh, has unique voice acting and like puns that they'll say when they're attacking you and like one liners <laughs> and like one liners they spout off when you die. Um, like, uh, there's a, there's a Sphinx enemy. And because this is also developed by level five, she goes, here's, she looks, she'll go, like, here's a riddle for you, Leighton fans. And then she'll come like running at you. Like, <laughs> so it's like, and like the game, the game is like, third wall aware that it's an rpg and it will talk yeah. about it'll talk about rpg tropes and like use acronyms but then like a- assign different meanings to those acronyms <laughs> like i don't remember what they say rpg means but they'll be like they go the they strip so like, this is an rpg and then they're like like and then like whatever it means like as, as far as like an event like being an adventure and they have like their own word for like what rpg is so like they'll openly <laughs> they'll openly talk about like mechanics and stuff but then like obfuscate them to make it fit into the world <laughs> so like it's really just fun and funny and i'm and i'm just enjoying the heck out of it so far oh that's cool that's yeah. cool i can this see what- it becoming an addiction yeah, definitely. This is this is one of those games that uh, didn't seem to review very well, but everyone I know who's played it has had a wonderful time with it. So, yeah, um, yeah, I'll probably check that out myself at some point. It sounds like a nice game to sort of chill out and relax with. Yeah, an online multiplayer too. So if you do get playing it, we can oh, always cool. we can always dive in together and and dungeon crawl. It's it's pretty cool. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's one of those games. You know, as with a lot of the games we talk about on here, like context is super important Mm -hmm. right so like i think a blind reviewer who was assigned this game going into it without understanding the history of the franchise because this is a property that's existed in japan for some time has a companion animated series etc we just got this game um so if you if you don't take the time to research or understand what snack world is you probably also don't even know that this is just a slightly enhanced port of a 3ds title yeah so yeah. of course it looks clunky and it plays a little clunky and the graphics aren't super beautiful and the geometry is not mind-blowing because this is a 3ds game mm-hmm. that's just been ported with all of its dlc content to the switch it's, it's yeah. the, and it's the complete edition of a ds game mm-hmm so r- right away, I think people going in to this thinking it's some new hot shit Switch game <laughs> and, not, and, not under- <laughs> and not understanding what it is are going to be disappointed immediately by its presentation, the amount yeah. of content, the fact that most missions can be blown through in like five minutes because it's designed for bite-sized play. That sounds great to me. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's delightful. It's good for your lunch break. If you're traveling yeah. with your Switch, it's perfect. Yeah, I um, mean, that's exactly why we enjoyed Lapis Labyrinth, wasn't it? Because each each mission was so short and easily digestible. You could just dip into it and have a bit of fun with it. Exactly. Yeah, and, and it it's perfect for me because I just don't have a lot of time for playing games. So like, I can fire yeah. up Snack World for like 45 minutes 
Mm-hmm. And and like that's my evening of gaming is just to get a couple missions in. Same reason yeah. I like Mon- Monster Hunter. It's like yeah. ha- half hour, 45 minutes. You feel like you've accomplished something. You walk mm-hmm. away with some loot and then you can walk away. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's super important. That's super important. And probably more so than it's ever been sort of in the past as well. It's it's, yeah. it's really good that we have games like that around still. I mean, this this isn't a game for people who want complex character development. This isn't nope, a game for nope. people who want story. Mm-hmm. This is a this is a loot grind. That's mm-hmm. it's there in the title, Snack World: The Dungeon Crawl. It's literally, <laughs> it's literally like, and like they know, like the characters know, like when you initiate a mission, they're like, let's go get some stuff. Like it's all, <laughs> it's all like everything is just focused, like. And then internally, there's, like, layers of irony where, like, the entire world is just, like, focused around, like, uh, making fun of, like, cell phone culture and consumerism in the modern era, which is, like, all part of it. So, like, all equipment you get has a a brand, like a a fashion brand and a color. Mm -hmm. And every time you sign in every day... There's a new fashion. You have to check your cell phone for the fashion trend, like what, <laughs> like like what brands are on the rise and what colors are on the rise, and then you can rejigger your equipment, and then the 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 more strongly your current loadout matches the daily fashion trends, you get like bonuses. <laughs> That's awesome. It's like you have a cell phone, and like everything you do in the game is unlocked by like getting apps for that cell phone. Yeah. Um, there's like one of the big things mechanically is there, you have what are called snacks, which are basically enemies you make friends with. Yeah. Um, and then they, they Pokemon style, you collect the enemies and then they can, you can have one equipped to follow you around like a familiar and then you can have multiple equipped that you can just like summon in once to like do a move. Um, you get those by like beating them down and then like befriending them and like you take a picture of them with your cell phone and then like you have their <laughs> and then you have their profile like that's how they're your friend is like in your, <laughs> so it's all just like funny and self-referential and, and kind of just making fun of the way we live our shitty modern lives <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh that sounds super cool hey i'm gonna have to gonna have to try and get hold of a copy of that then from yeah, the sound of things and just just the puns man the puns I, just, i'm all for a good pun like the first boss is a medusa and and everything is food right everything is food puns yeah because it's snack world so like the first major dungeon is the gorgonzola ruins <laughs> <laughs> right like that that yeah. sets the t- like the whole game is like that yeah oh wonderful Yes, I very much like the sound of that. Good stuff. All right, yeah. anything else you've been up to? Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I've been playing, I think, the most. Uh, I'm still mm-hmm. kind of gradually working my way bit by bit through um, uh, Destiny Connect when, when time allows. And uh, yeah. uh, I've also started up uh, Moero Chronicle H, but I'd like to get oh, a yeah. couple yeah. more dungeons under my belt in that before I talk about it with any... Uh, any uh, details because okay cool it has much more to reveal to me i think it's one of those yes. games where like every 10 minutes they're throwing new mechanics at you yeah yeah oh cool all right well over to me then um so uh recently i've been playing quite a few things because um those of you who have been following me may have seen that uh, i've been doing a few uh, review assignments for nintendo life recently uh, which is cool so i've had the chance to uh, play some games that I was probably going to play at some point anyway, um, but having a, a deadline meant that I, I I needed to play them now, <laughs> so I could get paid for playing them. Um, so I want to talk about um, uh, a couple of those. So first one I want to talk about is Dead or School. Oh yes, um, please. Which is a super cool game. This is a game that originally launched on PC um, as an early access game, and they were sort of gradually developing it over the course of like. I think it was about four years in total it took for them to, to actually finish the whole thing. And then when it was finished, they released it on PS4 and Switch as well. And uh, both of those versions have just recently uh, come west, uh, thanks to Marvelous Europe, who published it. Um, yeah, this this is a super cool game. This is a side-scrolling platformer um, with sort of loot whoring elements to it. So um, it's not quite... Uh, an open structure 2d platformer in that there is a very clear path you take through each of the levels rather than sort of 
going back and exploring too much with new abilities and stuff you don't really get any new exploration abilities as you progress through the game but it, it has the it has a sort of open feel to it um so it it doesn't feel like linear levels and you do have the option to go back and 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 sort of revisit things if you want to there's just not much reason to for for a lot of it um but it's it's an absolutely huge game it took me about 30 hours to play through the whole thing which is oh, very wow. long for that kind of game um and uh yeah it's got really really good uh combat because there's a, a variety of different weapons you can use um your character has has three weapons on hand at all times uh she has a melee weapon she has a gun and she has a launcher uh but within each of those three categories there are different variations as well so the melee weapon for example you can have like a fencing sword which is good for sort of quick jabs and doing lots of quick damage very quickly uh, that was the word quick a lot of times, but yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, or you can have like a big katana that s sort of swings and does a lot more damage, but because it's so large and heavy, it's um, you can't swing it as quickly and that sort of thing. Um, again, the guns, you have like machine guns and assault rifles and sniper rifles and shotguns and that sort of thing, and they all handle differently. Um, and they're all very modifiable as well. So... Um, there's a system where each gun has an ability attached to it, which you can basically re-roll at random by using one of the game's currencies. Uh, and that's that's an ability that is attached to the weapon itself. And then each weapon can have two mods attached to it as well, which allows you to take a bit more control of it. So each mod has both, uh, like a usually a bonus to one of your stats uh, and one of these abilities as well. So you might attach something that increases your maximum life and also causes enemies to explode when you defeat them or that sort of thing so it's very very customizable um and the yeah the combat is really really satisfying there's some really excellent boss fights in it there's an interesting story uh that is actually um a sequel to the creator's uh manga that he did a while back uh, there was a, a manga called machine doll nanami chan um, that I don't think ever got translated to English, unfortunately. But you can you can see the Japanese version on his website for free. Um, but yeah, it was it was basically he was he was writing this manga, um, and it was doing all right. But um, he, he, the creator wanted to sort of expand things a bit more and make a bit more money and so on. So he decided to make a game that sort of supported what was going on with the manga, um, and the result was Dead or School, um, and it's. Yeah, it's 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 a wonderful game. I mean, it's got some rough edges here and there because it was obviously developed on the cheap. Um, but it's a small, independently developed game that was made by like three or four people in total, and they've achieved something really, really good with it. It's it's a really excellent game that I was absolutely glued to for the entire time I was playing it, and not just because I had a deadline. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed that. So I encourage anyone who is interested in uh, that sort of thing to check it out because it's it's a really sort of creative and interesting take on this sort of post-apocalyptic thing. Um, playing Diablo as a side scroller is really cool as well. Um, it's a lot of fun. The the platforming is really sort of tight and solid. Uh, although I would recommend against playing in handheld mode on Switch when the the frame rate takes a bit of a dive on there. But in in docked mode, it's absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, that's really cool. So I, I encourage you to check it out. And uh, you can even get a packaged version of that from Europe uh, if you want one as well. So um, yeah, so Marvelous have, have done that one proud. Um, second thing I want to mention is uh, another review I did for Nintendo Life that went live recently. This was the visual novel called Seabed. Um, this is a um, it's a kinetic novel, so it's one that you just read. There's no choices to make or anything in there, and it's it's very long. Again, it's about sort of 25, 30 hours altogether, so it's a long read. Um, but it's really cool. It's a really interesting exploration of um, how people deal with grief. So it's not the most uplifting thing, although um, the characterization in it is such is that there's sort of a sense of melancholy through the whole thing, but there are sort of cheerful and nice characters who make you feel good in it as well so the whole thing centers around the relationship between um two girls and uh one of them the the sort of initial protagonist of it believes that this girl just disappeared uh but as as you go through the course of the story you realize that she's uh dealing with some sort of mental health issues that relate to her grief and she's sort of forgotten the exact circumstances of why they're not together anymore and you go through it and you 
come to understand the truth behind the situation and you see things from the other girl's perspective and so on and and, and she's also got her own issues in dealing with things so it, it does a really excellent job of kind of weaving this mystery around these two women and exactly what happened between them and it's incredibly well written and wonderfully localized by uh, fruit bat factory who are a company you've done really sort of diverse range of games so they've done everything from sort of um uh, what's it called 100 percent orange juice which is uh, a super silly board game which i encourage people to check out uh, to this and they've got some really talented uh translators working on there because this is this is a very wordy game it's a nvl style visual novel so it's one where the text fills the screen rather than goes in dialogue boxes so there's a lot of descriptive text in this and they've done a fantastic job with uh, sort of really uh really nailing the kind of evocative descriptions and so on so if you're up for that kind of experience which i know not everyone is but if you're up for that kind of experience a long read uh which is ideal for times like this uh then yeah seabed uh give it a look and the last thing i want to talk about then is uh current uh feature that i'm doing on murraygamer.net is uh on the atelier series i'm on atelier iris 2 the azoth of destiny at the minute and uh, having a lot of fun with it so um I know we talked a, a bit about um, how you felt about the ones after Eternal Manor last time, and uh, turns out I think you were you, you're misremembering some of the things that you came across, or or that you had. Um, well, I mean, maybe you still you still disliked it, but 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 perhaps not for the, re- <laughs> not for the reasons that we we talked about last time. So, listen, so, it was uh, a long time ago. When did those yeah. games come out? Uh, two thousand and I think this one was two thousand and four five or six something yeah, like so that so yeah so it is a 15, long time ago so, 15 years yeah. ago i'll so let I you was, off i'll let you I off. was like 19 <laughs> like i remember not liking two as much as one let's yeah. put it that way yeah and i remember yeah. liking three more than two but less than one yeah yeah that, that seems to be a pretty common sentiment um two is interesting because um if anything i would argue it kind of plays up the the kind of rpg aspect even more um so the actual crafting side of things it's still there and it's still important but you don't spend a ton of time doing it it's it's mostly it's mostly focusing on the male protagonist who's going around and exploring and getting into fights and working through the plot and so on and then just occasionally you switch back to the female protagonist who um sort of does all the crafting and makes packs with manners and so on um and some people from from what i can judge from some reviews of the time a, a lot of which are not very good i have to say uh, from a <laughs> sort of technical perspective i, I found one that, that said this game was developed by nipponichi for example and it's like no no do your research that was um, during the time before people understood that developers and publishers were not the same thing it was a yeah. really weird time yeah yeah um but anyway yeah this was this is quite a common complaint compared to the original in that they sort of played down the crafting side of things a bit and it was a bit more of a conventional rpg there's a lot of dungeon crawling in this one um and the dungeons are all designed in such a way that um sort of really emphasize the kind of isometric perspective that they've been using so oh, they're very they're very sort of um the dungeons are all quite large and they're all quite labyrinthine and they have different paths you can take through them and so on you, they're not quite so complex that you need to map them but they are ones that you need to explore a bit um which can comp- yeah which i really like um and i also like the fact that uh, this was the first appearance of the encounter bar that is most primarily associated with art and Elico these days but um this was the first appearance of that which is you have a bar on screen that shows how many encounters there are left in your current area so if you have enough fights you can basically defeat all the enemies in the area and then explore freely uh which is perfect for this sort of dungeon crawling situation because it means that you can beat up a load of enemies and then take your time making sure you track down all the treasures and so on and if you come also, back to the dungeon or the bar reset like if you want to grind so, so so the way it happens is um generally each sort of uh each sort of floor or distinct area of a dungeon has its own meter so like if you go to a different floor of it the meter will reset to the top one but if you go back to that previous floor it will remain where it was uh but if you reach a save point and um and save which also replenishes all your health it will reset all the encounter bars in the dungeon so if you want to grind you can do okay. um there's not a ton of reason to to be honest uh, because it's it's not the most difficult rpg i've played but there is quite a strong emphasis on um this this uh an interesting mechanic called chaining 
which is um, the game uses a time bar system a bit like uh, what you'd see in something like Grandia and was subsequently reused in Blue Reflection um, in which you have an attack that can knock enemies back on the time bar and if you knock them back into this specially marked area on the bar it slows them down and it starts a chain so any attacks that you land while an enemy is in this special part of the bar on screen um, contribute to a chain and the higher you get this chain um, basically the maximum that that chain reaches in the course of one battle um, the higher that is the more experience points and the more skill points you get so if you take the time to rather than just sort of defeating enemies as quickly as possible if you take time to sort of build up a big chain you can progress a lot more quickly than if you're just grinding through um as many encounters as possible so it's quite interesting from that perspective um i can see why some people wouldn't have liked it quite as much as the first one but at the same time they've also looking back on eternal mana now a lot of these systems in that feel very experimental and unfinished in some mm. in some respects like the crafting system in eternal mana there was this review system that attached um sort of adjectives and descriptors to all of the things that you created there was no mechanical purpose for that whatsoever it, it didn't do anything it was purely for flavor uh whereas in iris 2 um the things that you attach while you've lost some of the sort of flavor descriptions like stinky and big and lewd and that sort of thing um you've got much more practical things that you can attach to different things like you can uh sort of increase the damage that something does or add elemental damage or increase the effectiveness of a healing item and so on it's a it's a lot more like the traits system that they used in uh the arland series in which oh, you can okay. sort of pa pass traits from one ingredient to another down a chain of different things that you're you, you're making together um but again, it feels like they, they, they've sort of almost gone too far in the other direction with this one, and they've they sort of simplified it a bit. And and once you, once you've made something once, you can then basically duplicate it with this mana energy that you get throughout the course of the game, uh, which kind of takes a bit of the emphasis off finding the ingredients and and combining them together and so on. It it makes the whole game a lot more quick and streamlined, which is good for some people, um, but for some people who were who really liked the crafting aspect of atelier games I, I i can see why they're disappointed i'm having a great time with it i'm really enjoying it it's a nice contrast to the first one with some nice sort of references and things to the first one as well so you can see how they tied together um i think i'm coming towards the end of it now so um yeah looking forward to seeing how that concludes and then how three compares to it as well they've been really interesting games so far i've been really enjoying them um and yeah they're definitely worth checking out Right, uh, I think that's everything. Anything else you want to bring up before we move on? No, let's talk about some shooters. Alrighty, let's take a short break and then let's talk about some shooters. So we'll see you in a moment. Welcome back for our third segment today. We thought we would talk about some Psycho Shooters as we've both been playing the Psycho Shooting Stars collection on Nintendo Switch. Um, so, a um, bit of history for those unfamiliar, first of all, because I, I wasn't super familiar with Psycho before I started checking these out. I just knew that I like shooter maps and uh, the prospect of having two collections with 12 games, very appealing. Um, but Psycho um, first came about in 1992. Uh, and they were an offshoot of the team that made the game Aero Fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently what happened uh, was um, one of the people who was working um, for Video System, Shin Nakamura, um, he wasn't a big fan of the company's plans to start working on Neo Geo games, and he wanted to make more vertically scrolling games like Aero Fighters, but he was finding it difficult to do so on um, horizontal monitors. So... Uh, he and a bunch of people formed Psycho to continue making the games that he enjoyed making. Um, mostly um, arcade shooters, but they also made a few erotic Mayong games as well, uh, as well along the way. Um, 
and yeah, a lot of these got ported to home consoles at various times. So their first game was in 1993, which was Sengoku Ace, also known as Samurai Aces over here. Um, and they kept making stuff up until about 2005. Um, although they they got taken over by another company in um, 2002, and there was a bunch of stuff developed with Saikyo's name on it that wasn't actually Saikyo uh, yeah. in many cases. And there's, I think at least one of those in this in the psycho shooting stars collection so yeah. yeah so there's quite an interesting collection of games amongst this lot um so i mean where do you want to start yeah so so you're just not experienced with psycho you, you were saying like you don't have like a history with that. no I, I before these collections i i'd never come across these games before i was sort of familiar in passing with the name of the strikers 1945 series um but i i kind of sort of been put off that series by the name so like i'm not a huge fan of sort of um war themed stuff uh, uh, sort of <laughs> right, war right. themed stuff uh, and so obviously obviously just seeing the name strikers 1945 i thought ah oh, this is just going to be like war planes i didn't expect <laughs> it to be giant robot monsters bursting out of things and yeah ridiculous so yeah, evidently it's i've been best. missing out for a very long time um but yeah that 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 was that was sort of my only my only um sort of experience with them up until that point was just knowing the name of strikers 1945 so it's been really interesting to visit these games for the first time yeah okay so i mean i think before we dig into particular games i think we should maybe just talk a bit kind of about some of the signatures of psycho yeah like what, okay. ma what what makes a psycho shooter because mm -hmm. just like any of the other shooter houses out there like the, the classic shooter houses like because when we're talking about psycho most of the games we're going to talk about are from a very specific era the yeah. ps the ps1 saturn era and the um and the dreamcast era yeah um that like golden age of shooters um so I think one thing that we need to talk about in terms of Psycho is very specifically that Psycho doesn't make Danmaku games. Yes. They, yes. Their, their games are not bullet hell shooters. Like their games are more in on like the Raiden side. They're a bit more deliberate. They're they're not crazy unlivable patterns. Like these are very deliberate deliberately designed shooters. They're not um they're not insane, like screen lit up with neon pink shooters. Mm -hmm. Um that's a very important thing to point out about their games, I think. Um, also, uh, I think the great hallmark of Psycho is the the power up icons. Yep. The bullet, the bullet power up icons, um, and the bomb icons are mm -hmm. consistent throughout all their games. They, yes. they look the, they look the same, um, and it's just like that's how you know a Psycho shooter is that very specific bullet with the rotating with the P on it that rotates. Yeah, and like that's that's like the signature of the Psycho game is like the specific power up icon, um, which I love. Except for in Dragon Blaze, they made them swords, which is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it looks the same stylistically, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Which I think is really clever. Um, I also think just in general, Psycho games are some of the earliest. Well, Arrow Fighters, really, but. Um, these games are some of the earliest games to have uh, varied rosters. Yeah, yeah. With with where the care where it wasn't just a matter of like this guy shoots a concentrated shot or this guy shoots a spread shot. Like radically unique shot patterns and sometimes like very innovative, um, like innovative attack methods that were yeah. different than um, like they were some of the biggest innovators kind of in the early days of doing these kind of shooters where they give you five characters and the game was totally different depending on which character you were to pick yeah um which was uh which was a holdover from arrow fighters the original arrow fighters was like that um goofiness there's like a certain degree of like tongue-in-cheek to psycho shooters they don't take mm -hmm. themselves super seriously uh, yeah so and, and one of the big hallmarks of the psycho games too is um that they are big fans of like the loop structure so when mm -hmm. you beat the game you haven't really beaten the game it just starts right back up again with level one and then um you've got to beat it again with a higher difficulty level faster bullets different shot patterns yeah um, and i i think that's kind of also a holdover um because they were very chummy with capcom 
mm-hmm. Psy- Psycho for a long time. Um, it, it always kind of reminded me of Ghosts and Goblins. I always did the same thing. <laughs> um, I think, to the first level, um, the notion that usually most Psycho shooters have... Um, the first three levels come from a pool that shuffles based on which fighter you choose. Yeah. Um, that was something that um, some other companies would pick up later down the line, like Cave and stuff. But um, Psycho was some of the first people I remember to kind of have a structure like that, which kind of spiced up your replays. Um, and from like an arcade perspective, it, it gave you an, an excuse to come back to that cabinet over again because you mm-hmm. might actually experience the levels in a different order or, or yeah. try a different level for the first time. So those are some of the things that like kind of are hallmarks of Psycho games for me. Was there anything else you kind of picked up on that kind of distinguishes them? Um, I think for me, probably the main thing uh, that's distinguished for me is the sort of very strong sense of physicality to them. So yes. like the... Um, the, the sense that the, your weapons have real power to them they have real impact to them like um I, 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 the first ones i played out of the collection were the strikers games and this is really apparent in these there's um and it's like a, a, a real mix of them as well so there's like one of the one of the planes in strikers 1945 has this barrage of shots that really feels like it's tearing into the enemy planes and so on and there's another one that fires out missiles and when the missiles hit the enemies they slow right down so it's like they're pushing through the armor and there's a real sense of sort of to it all <laughs> yeah yeah i know I, lo- I love it like i i always think back to like, i love uh, i love in gunbird too i love to play the robot valpiro yeah and uh his secondary fire is just buzz saws <laughs> and like when those buzz saws hit the enemies they slow down and they're sparks yeah like ah uh, yeah just uh, the idea that the, the your your weapons meet resistance when they hit something yeah. solid it's tremendous yeah i think that's that's sort of been the main distinguishing thing for me so far so all right, so we've talked about the defining features of Psycho Shoot'em Ups then. So do you want to get into some specifics? Yeah, so how do you want to do this? Series by series, chronologically? Um, I reckon series by series. I, I have played most of them at this point. I haven't spent a lot of time with Gunbird 2, but I have played all of the games to varying degrees now. So I, I think series by series is probably the way to do it. Yeah, great. So I think we'll let's dive right in with uh, Strikers, because I think that's probably the most famous yes um not my favorite but probably the most famous in terms of um in terms of psycho's reputation Mm -hmm. um so like you mentioned earlier striker is essentially is uh, kind of a creative play on the idea of world war ii um uh aerial combat but except for three which is more modern even though yes. they kept it, like I don't understand why number three is strike still Strikers 1945 three when it's like clearly taking place like a hundred years in the future when like where like well, stealth, it, stealth bomb- bombers have lasers, but it had different names in some places. In some places, it was called Strikers 1999, but oh, the yeah. version the version in the collection is called Strikers 1945 three. So yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, Strikers is basically like the idea of aerial combat but with like speculative sci-fi mixed in so like strange planes and you think you're fighting a a battleship but then like as soon as you blow up all that battleship's turret it craps out a boat and then that boat transforms into a giant robot with gatling guns and pontoons for feet (laughs) like like psych and another hallmark of the psycho game um which strikers does with like ultimate aplomb is these ridiculous spectacle transforming enemies yes like yes. robots that shift and change and have all kinds of unique properties and you think you've got it down and like three more arms shoot out with rocket launchers attached to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so each of these boss fights is sort of a, a multi-phase affair that seems to be a recurring theme in uh, a lot of the games so you um you fight the first form and then as you say that blows up and might take you to a different part and then then the final phase in most cases is some form of of giant robot type thing with uh with different things and one thing i really like that's actually another sort of defining feature that that we didn't mention is that all of these bosses have lots of bits you can blow off them yeah yeah 
um, yeah, so you've got the the sort of satisfaction of uh, of shooting off the various weapons. There's sort of uh, strategic worth in doing that as as well as it being a means of uh, of getting better scores and so on as well. But yeah, it's it's really satisfying to sort of blow pieces off these different bosses and sort of finally finish them off when you've already pretty much wrecked them. Yeah, and they, and it all wraps up with that physicality we were discussing earlier, right? Like they yeah. they explode off in like a really satisfying way, and yeah. sometimes there's a little animation of them like tumbling to the ground below, and like it just gets better and better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, Strikers was kind of varied collection of ships. Um, there was an option based charge shot system so as you powered up it would add op like hovering options to your ship um, and then you could charge it up Mega Man style to unleash uh, a charge shot those charge shots were not really limited or controlled in any way you could just do them as part of your normal um, you know as part of your normal uh, strategy uh, every ship was unique, uh, different movement speeds, a different charge attack, a different bomb, and a different shot pattern. Just like a totally, yes. each ship is a totally different experience to play as. And it's one of the, like I, like I mentioned before, it's one of the first games I can remember as a kid playing in the arcades that, that, that felt like that. Like, right? I used to yeah. love Raiden, but Raiden just had a ship. Yeah. The, the Raiden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you had the three different weapons in that, but it was always picking between those three weapons for the one ship, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, Strikers just kind of set that formula up. Um, old school, beautiful pixel art, um, and tough, uh, but fair. Yeah. tough, tough, but fair. Yeah, uh, I, I think is the big thing. Um, yeah, one thing I do appreciate about. Um, about these these games specifically the ports in the collection is the the wide range of difficulty levels there are so yeah. it, in in most of them um there are seven different difficulty levels ranging from monkey up to like super hard or something like that um and yeah that that just means that you have the opportunity to kind of um get a feel for the game without it being overwhelming by playing on one of the lower levels to begin with and i i've always said in in shoot 'em ups more than pretty much any other genre out there there is absolutely no shame in playing on easy difficulties in choose em ups because it helps you to learn the mechanics it helps you to understand the systems behind them and this is especially apparent in in these games because w with the fact that you've got these different shot patterns and the charge attacks and the different ways the bombs work and so on you need to take a bit of time to learn how each ship functions in order to be able to play it effectively and then you can focus on sort of the challenge of avoiding the various bullet patterns and so on yep yeah and it needs to be pointed out too that in a lot of them with seven difficulty levels normal is five yeah <laughs> normal is five and they get progressively more insulting yeah i think the, the easiest is monkey i yeah. think is it's like monkey then baby and then like yeah. and then like child and then, and then easy, easy then normal <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah so what's interesting too is like tracking the strikers games is like to follow game to game is to also kind of track the evolution of the visual style and like uh, of uh of psycho as well as like their different experimentations with mechanics right so like yeah following strikers is cool because it's two years in between each strikers game like 45 mm -hmm. came out in 1995 strikers 2 came out in 1997 and then strikers 3 or strikers 99 as it's sometimes called came out in 1999 so as the industry changed and they experimented with mechanics each game was kind of different in its own unique way yeah. so for instance strikers 2 so like strikers 2 is probably the game that instigated my love of psycho because like yeah i bought a copy of strikers 2 for the ps1 on a whim like out of like a discount bin at a walmart for like 14.99 yeah. like it was published by like Age tech or like one of those like offshoot like cheap companies that just like published yeah. arcade stuff on the cheap and uh fell in love with it like immediately and like it was during a time when i was in like high school where like my buddies and i were like really obsessed specifically with like world war ii heavy armor military hardware 
Yeah. So just like everything about the like the fetishized presentation of heavy armor in that game, like spoke to me like immediately. Yeah. But like in retrospect, when I play Strikers Two, Christ, is it ugly compared to some of the other psychic? <laughs> <laughs> because because in like '97, everyone had pre-rendered fever. Yeah. And like so yeah. like Strikers Two is not the prettiest of the bunch in terms of like the way it looks. It's like everything has this like muddy pre-rendered look to it yeah strikers in general is, is quite brown isn't it yeah yeah not not three though three is like really bright and blue there's a lot of like water and silvers and grays and like yeah it, it has a much a much brighter appearance but two is mu is a muddy mess but mm. mechanically much more interesting than one yeah. right so yeah. like two introduced almost like the fighting game style charge bar yeah. So, like, much like the first one, you had a charge attack, but you had to you had to earn it. You had to build that charge bar and then spend it on those charge attacks. So it was a totally different, like, strategic idea because you couldn't abuse that charge shot anymore. You had to you had to save it for when you actually needed it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it had multiple levels to it as well, didn't it? So if if you were more patient and saved up for a level three charge shot, then you'd have a more effective or a longer lasting charge shot than if you just sort of spunked it off as soon as you had it available. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just it's just a less forgiving game in general. So like one of the things mm -hmm. I, th I think is like, it's a really small thing, but like, I don't know if you noticed that the bombs in Strikers 2 function very differently than bombs in a lot of other shoot 'em ups um, Yes. Generally speaking, a bomb in a shoot 'em up is usually a lifesaver. It's usually yes. a screen clear. It usually gives you a moment of invincibility, wipes all the other bullets off screen. It's it's a lifesaver. The the bombs in Strikers 2 work a little differently than what's traditional in that they have a the bombs always have a physical presence. You always yeah. you're always either firing a large missile or summoning another ship. But when you do it, you're not invincible. You can still be mm -hmm. killed and all the enemy bullets still remain on screen. They don't clear out. But what the item you summon, be it another ship or a giant missile or a rocket or whatever, that is a shield that absorbs the enemy bullets. So yes. the idea is you have to not only understand when the timing is appropriate to deploy your bomb, but understand where it's going to deploy and how. So you can get behind it and ride it as a shield in order to help yourself out of that tricky situation. So like, yeah. there's a skill element to using your bomb instead of it just being like a, a split-second lifesaver. Which I think yeah. is subtle, but radically different from the way most other shooters function. Yeah, I, and I mean, that becomes quite a pattern throughout Psycho stuff in general. There's there's quite a few of their games that p have some sort of variation on that. The, the bombs are always unique in functionality. They're very rarely just an explosion that um, uh, that clears the screen. But but yeah, that, that, that specific uh, functionality that you're describing there, where um, you're not invincible and you have to use it as, as a shield and actually move with it. Yeah, that's that's something that's used a few times for sure. I mean, like, I straight up, like, in playing Strikers 2 earlier this week, I, I've, I've died. Like, I've killed myself because I have not skillfully deployed my bomb. Yes, yes. I forgot to get yeah. behind it, or I forgot to, to move with it, or I deployed it at a bad time, where I actually tra used it, it trapped me between bullets and, and it. Like, <laughs> it, 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 I, it, it's a really interesting way to play, and it radically changes the way you have to strategize. Um, yeah. The ships all have different secondary attacks. So in Strikers, original Strikers 45, uh, as you powered up, you got missiles. Yeah. Every ship got missiles. There weren't varied secondary attacks. Strikers 2 did away with that. So each ship bes doesn't have missiles anymore as a secondary attack that tacks on as you power up. It actually has varied attacks that change based on the personality and the functionality of the ship. So, like, the one I like, the flying pancake, is, like, the laser ship. And as that yeah. powers up, it gets lasers that hone in on enemies and cross over each other. Very different from a different ship, which does have missiles, right? So, it, it's now every ship is completely unique, not just in the pattern of its shots, but its charge shot and secondary shot. So, it's continuing yeah. to build on that uniqueness of each individual ship. 
Which is the one with the ship that fires out lightning bolts? Is that two or three? I can't remember which one it is. But there's, de there's definitely one that sort of shot out a actual sort of bright yellow lightning blasts from it as well. That was, oh. that was one of my favorites. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably the lightning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> um, that's been in all of them, but I don't think it actually did the lightning until two. Two, two yeah. is when like the really like speculative like laser weirdness started to become part yeah. of the picture. Yeah. Um, so then three comes about in 1999. Um, obviously modernized the setting, so it wasn't like clunky World War II vehicles anymore. We were talking like modern, like modern tech is in the mix. A lot of like speculative sci-fi look to things. Um, and three was really cool because it kind of hybridized a lot of the successes of one and two to make yeah. something that was a bit. Two was really punishing. One was mm -hmm. a bit more forgiving. Three kind of hybridized both of like kind of the bests of each one so like visually too so like unlike two which was just ugly pre-rendered stuff all around three has some pre-render work in the backgrounds but all the ships and enemies are classic analog sprite work it's a mm -hmm. much more attractive game than two was um Screen clearing bombs are back in three like en enemy like invincibility and and uh and bullets wipe out which yeah. is honestly welcome <laughs> because <laughs> because it's useful um uh as the game gets more modern um it, it does hew a bit closer to bullet hell um the patterns are a bit denser the shots move a bit faster it's a bit more challenging in that respect but um but it took kind of the best of both worlds from one and two and kind of made a game yeah. that was like the most playable in a lot yeah, of ways they they also followed the trend of making sort of more technical mechanics in this one as well yes. so there's a more complex scoring system in strikers uh, strikers 3 so um this mostly relates to the sort of collectible score items you can get in this one um so you, when you shoot certain enemies or ground installations um they'll drop gold bars that you can pick up for points and in strikers 3 what happens is if you collect them at the perfect time which is when they're sparkling um, oh, I think they're medals in this one actually rather than gold bars uh, yeah, yeah it's when the bars when in two yeah when they're facing the camera and, and flashing white you get 2000 points and you start a chain so if you can continually collect these medals with perfect timing you can gradually build up this massive score bonus it, it's very difficult to do like i the the biggest chain i've managed to get so far is uh two <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I, like but, it's like whenever we talk about complex scoring mechanics and shoot em ups like my brain doesn't register it i'm just trying not to die <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um but the, the the other mechanic I really like in Strikers Three that was also used in um, Dragon Blaze is the the technical bonus system, which is where every boss has a moment where you can insta kill them. Um, but oh it's, yeah, it's, it, it's it's very brief. And in Strikers, uh, this is what you need to save your bombs for, because what happens is that the usually usually this part of the boss's second phase, it will do it will do like. Uh, a unique animation like it will flip over it will do something unique and in doing that it will reveal a glowing core um, this will pretty much always coincide with their most intense attack pattern so what you have to do is you have to let off a bomb to clear out the the bullets that are coming your way and you have to get right up close and shoot this core at point blank range with perfect timing and that will immediately kill the boss and give you a huge score bonus it's very difficult to do um, but uh, that is that is the way of getting high scores in Strikers Three is getting this technical bonus on each of the bosses. So cool. Yeah, it's and it's super cool, but it's it's really difficult to do. Speaking of the bosses, too, um, you know, we talked about how like one of the hallmarks of the first of the Striker series is these like transforming robot boss phases. Uh, I thought it was yeah. really cool thematically. The bosses in Strikers Three have an insect theme instead of a humanoid robot theme. Yeah, like, it's like one of them's a spider, one of them's like a horn beetle with like the big pinchers in front. Like they they decided to mix it up from a design perspective, and I really thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very cool. Um, I think so, sort of the, the 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 narrative of this one, if you care, is sort of all to do with like nano machines and stuff as well. So there's, oh, there's the sort sense. of there's the sort of bug thing going on in the in the whole sort of thematic thing with it. So cool. yeah, yeah. So that's Strikers. 
<laughs> great, 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 great series. All of these are. So it's moving on in the same collection then. I don't think we need to talk about Soul Divide. I think in the history of the Moe Gamer podcast, we've paid enough lip service to Soul Divide. <laughs> <laughs> I but love Soul Divide. It's, it's a great so game. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, if you want to talk about it, we can. Uh, most most notably is that it's it's not Tate. It is a horizontal shoot 'em up. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, let's let's spend a bit of time on, on Soul Divide because <laughs> okay. it, it, it is it is worth acknowledging. I think, of course, if, it if is. We, if we, yeah, if we're going to do sort of psycho justice, but but Soul Divide, uh, I mean, we've mentioned it before, but sort of Soul Divide's main distinguishing feature, the the main time we talked about it last time was when we were talking about games that have a sort of handcrafted aesthetic about them, and the big thing with Soul Divide is that um, a lot of it is built as sort of uh, digitized models. So the bosses in particular, there's a very strong um, feeling of sort of like Ray Harryhausen horror models to them, and sort of things like Jason and the Argonauts and that kind of thing. They're, they're obviously blown up digitized models, but they they look so great. It, mm-hmm. It's just such a just such a distinctive look for that game. It's it's wonderful, and mechanically, Soul Divide is is interesting as well because it's um, again it's got it's got your usual shot and bomb and so on, but. Um, it also has a magic system whereby you collect scrolls to give you different spells and you charge up your magic bar and you can cast these different spells and different ones are useful in different circumstances some can be cast repeatedly if you have enough charge for them others can only be cast once before you need to find another scroll for them and then there's also this strange kind of beat-em-up connection to it as well yeah um, in fact, the, the whole design of Soul Divide, um, in terms of structure, is much closer to a beat 'em up than a traditional shoot 'em up, because what you tend to find in Soul Divide is that each level is a series of short encounters that you have to clear before you can move on. It's not like a, a standard constantly scrolling shoot 'em up where stuff flies past you and if you missed it, you missed your chance to get points from them. In Soul Divide, you specifically have to clear each encounter in order to move on. Um, and you you can do that by shooting things, uh, but each character also has a melee attack as well. And again, there's there's what three characters in Soul Divide, I think. Yeah. And they each they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. So one is particularly good at the melee attack and is is strong with it. And then there's at the other end of the spectrum, there's a sorceress who is better off shooting people. Um, and yeah, again, again, it it sort of it forces you to kind of think about your strategy and which character you're using and which one is most effective in particular situations. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting to play a shoot 'em up where you're you're dodging enemies that are charging towards you to to hit you with a sword, as well as ones that are just hurling bullets at you. I think that's a really interesting distinguishing feature that uh, that Soul Divide's got that yeah isn't really seen in any of the others. No, no, I mean there are melee attacks and and like uh, Gunbird has melee attacks, but you have to mm-hmm. you have to charge them. They're not like a specific yeah. part of your like your regular strategy. Uh, I'm sorry, Gunbird too has the yeah. melee. Uh, but um but yeah i mean soul divide like understanding when, when the appropriate timing is for your melee attack like that's the whole crux of the game like yeah. if, if an enemy swoops in at you and charges for a melee attack like you have to time your melee attack because it has a stun so like, it's the yeah. only way to like and your melee attack probably won't kill them like you probably need to melee attack maybe hit them two or three times then take advantage of the stun to back away and create a safe space for yourself like it's mm-hmm. it's uh it's really interesting to, to understand the the timing of when to like duck and weave with the melee when to create those stuns while still keeping the pressure on with your shots yeah because uh, like as you mentioned like the entire structure of soul divides based off of specifically structured encounters so like strategizing with how you're going to deal with each combination of enemies is a really important part of the way the game plays so you're gonna see like a wizard's gonna fly in with two skeletons and like you've got to be like okay so i need to keep the shot pressure on the wizard because the wizard's gonna be firing at me with his spells the skeletons are gonna charge me in what order the skeleton's gonna charge me like how do i deflect the skeletons and then go back to weave in and hit the wizard with a fire spell like it's almost, I dare say, a little bit of RPG DNA. Yeah, 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 and I think that's that's further borne out by the fact that there's there's healing in it as well, isn't there? Which is not 
really something that you get in the other games so right. like it, you, you might be able to get one extra life in a single loop of a typical psychia game it's normally at about four hundred thousand points but in soul divide um it's constantly dropping both healing items and extensions to your maximum health yeah well there's um, not one so he kills too right that needs to be yeah, stated yeah. outright too right? you have a life bar in soul divide yeah yeah but only one life yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, it's a yeah. really interesting game. Yeah, I, I I really like it. Again, it's it's one of those ones that um, I've sort of looked back on a few reviews of when it came out on um, what, what did Soul Divide release on? I think it came out on PS2 at one point, didn't it? Yeah. Um, I have a PS1 copy of it. Yeah, I, I, and again, it's one that it's one that people sort of seem to miss the point of a bit um, because it was, although this was a very good era for shoot 'em ups. It was not a great era for people understanding arcade games, um, right? Okay. Uh, getting console releases. So it was it was not a great era for sort of like if you look at reviews at the time, you, you'll see these things getting criticised for sort of being too simple. It's just a shoot 'em up, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah, that, it, that's that's always interesting when you, you sort of look back on these games from a modern perspective and sort of take them on their own terms and something, which is something we always talk about, but. Uh, yeah, um, it's it, it, it's strange. So, but yeah, I think this this is a lot better than sort of like reviews would seem to indicate. If you if you go by Metacritic, which you should never do, but, you know, <laughs> if if you happen if you happen to do so, Soul Divide is a lot better than reviews would seem to indicate. Cool. All right. Well, we've paid lip service to Soul Divide. So, where do you want to go next? Uh, well, let's just burn through Collection One and finish up with Dragon Blaze and Zero Gunner, and then we'll move on to sure. Collection Two. Um, sure. So, Dragon Blaze is essentially Strikers 4 <laughs> with a medieval theme. <laughs> I described it as, Str as Strikers 1495. Yeah, 1495. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So, but the big, the okay, so obviously it, it's basically Strikers, but it's got a medieval theme and you're a character on a dragon in a fantasy realm. Yes. Um, the, also, also, it's got pink bullets. It does have pink bullets. It's true. <laughs> They're very pink. The big mechanical hook of Dragon Blaze is what I like to call the R-type option hook, in that mm -hmm. there is a button where you can separate from your dragon and operate autonomously from it. So you can yes. you can set your dragon down to continue to lay suppressing fire, then separate from it, then fly around and shoot. Let's, and, let's not underplay this. You throw your dragon at people. Yeah, straight <laughs> up. Straight up you do. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You throw your dragon at people. And, uh, yeah. and then you can press the button again to recall the dragon back to you. So it's yeah. really cool for boss fights, right? Because you can just, like, set the dragon out, like, let the dragon hammer on the boss. Then you worry about survival and, like, pick picking off, like, the popcorn enemies that are coming off yeah. the sides. Like, there's a lot of really cool opportunities for strategy there with, the, with that mechanic. Yeah. This also um, uses a variation on the technical bonus from Strikers 3 as well. Okay. So... Um, again, each of the bosses has a brief vulnerable moment uh, when you can insta-kill them. Uh, and in this one, rather than having to use a bomb and then hit them from point blank range, all you have to do is you just have to throw your dragon at their weak point. Oh, so, okay. Like, they reveal their core, you fire off your dragon, and if it hits them with the perfect timing, you will immediately kill that boss and get a big score bonus. And... It's still challenging, but I can I can do that a lot more reliably in Dragon Blaze than I can pull off the one in Strikers Three. So, uh, go me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the bosses are really cool in Dragon Blaze yes. too. They're just yes. these hideous monstrosities, and they are huge as well. They're often sort of multi-screen things. Um, I'm thinking specifically of like the the water stage in this oh, one, where yeah. you're flying up that that sort of river with all the buddhist statues in it and you sort of like you just see its tail first of all and you're, fl you're shooting bits off its tail and you're working your way up and until so you reach this sort of hideous kind of biomechanical thing that's sort of got the faces of buddhist statues on it that are spitting bullets at you and you're blowing those off and revealing sort of mechanical stuff underneath and it's all on fire and there's sparks flying everywhere it's just beautiful it's really beautiful. neat like especially in that stage like how basically with Dragon Blaze, they take the tropes of a uh, shoot 'em up that think like, like things you would normally expect to see in Strikers, specifically like with like military hardware, and then how they adapt it to the fantasy theme. Like in so yes. many ways, that like river battle level in Dragon Blaze is a classic ocean level in 
any shoot 'em up with a, a ship theme where you're just traveling up the hull of an amazing aircraft carrier, and then like the the capital, uh, you know, the captain's chamber with all the guns is like the end pinnacle of that fight. But the fight lasts the whole stage, and like or like yeah. a, tr- a train fight, and like they've adapted that to this like grotesque like monster in like a fantasy setting and. Uh, just really clever from a design perspective and a visual yeah. presentation perspective. Um, yeah, and I, and I just I love a, I love a shooter with a different theme. I love a shooter yeah. that that's that's medieval or as we'll get when we talk about Sengoku Ace or Samurai Ace is like just a a, a neat unique uh, theme that's not just ships and tech. So Dragon Blaze does that perfectly because it's just full of curiosity and bright color. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is a very colourful one. So there was a deliberate... I, I mean, I mentioned the pink bullets before. There was a, there was a deliberate choice to make the bullets pink in this rather than the sort of red and yellow ones that we'd had in the Striker series. And, like, a lot of your shots are blue as well, so it, there's, there's a clear distinction between what you're firing and what the enemies are firing. and it, it gives it quite a different feel, but just like all the backgrounds are very, uh, very vibrant as well. So... Like, if you just look at screenshots of the different levels, they've all got a very clear colour theme going on. Mm-hmm. So there's, like, a desert level. There's the there's the river level that we're talking about. There's, like, an undersea level as well at one point that's very blue. Um, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's prob- probably one of my favourites, this one. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great game. It's absolutely a great game. All of these are great games. <laughs> so, uh, Zero Gunner. Uh, that's, mm. the, that's the last game on the Alpha Collection. Um, I was really grateful to be able to play this because I'd never played this before. Yes. Um, so, the, so the backstory on this one was that it came out on Dreamcast originally, mm-hmm. didn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those ones that's become very rare and difficult to get a hold of. Uh, like when it, when I looked into Dreamcast copies when I was writing about it on Moe Gamer, they were going for like at least one hundred to two hundred pounds, depending on the condition they were in and whether uh, they were boxed. That's not so a on. surprise. The Dreamcast yeah. shooter scene is is really really deep collector wise yeah yeah now the other interesting thing about the zero gunner version that's in this collection is um if you look at its logo it's actually called zero gunner two minus um and the reason for that is it's not a direct port of the dreamcast version okay uh, because because the original code for the dreamcast version was lost oh um and so basically what um the the company who developed a lot of these ports called zero div had to do uh, was that they had to rebuild this game from scratch oh, so they wow. they had they had like a few assets from the original but most of it they had to rebuild completely from scratch um for the switch uh and and so what you've got here is it, it uses a lot of what they could from the original arcade and dreamcast versions um but there are a couple of areas where it's got very slight differences and that's why they put the minus in the title because they knew that big because they knew that some people would sort of see this as a a slightly lesser version than the original because i mean they couldn't they couldn't recreate the original there was no way of doing that yeah i didn't know that yeah i don't know but this is cool zero gunner is cool because a A, so this is the last arcade game developed by psych yes this was for the Naomi hardware, which was essentially Dreamcast, Dreamcast arcade board. Um, and this was it. Like, this was it before they were taken over um, and, and fused with x Knots in 2002. And, like, everything else they made was for home console after this point yeah. for the PS2 specifically and the PSP. Um, so it kind of just, like, as a, as a nugget of history, like, this was, like, the last great Psycho arcade game. Yeah. Um, so what makes zero gunner special so much Mm. it is a helicopter shooter yes and because it is a helicopter shooter they they do this properly as well it's it's not it's not just a shoot 'em up where the ship happens to be a helicopter they actually handle this properly you you can do things a helicopter can do yes yes because you are a helicopter the entire mechanics of the game center around the fact that you are a helicopter and what that means is you have a dedicated button to lock your movement so that you rotate on a pintle and can fire in full 360 degrees and it is glorious yes (laughs) (laughs) it is glorious um you can rotate on your axis. You can release that button to then lock yourself in that position. So you can fire on a diagonal. You can go to the top of the screen and fire down. Whatever you want to do. And it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, this was also because it was made during the Dreamcast era. A lot of Naomi home games were made. A lot of Naomi arcade games were made and developed with the idea that they would eventually be ported to the Dreamcast because it could easily be done. So this was not a Tate game. You've got the full screen presentation on this. Yeah, and the um, and the Switch version is widescreen as well. It's worth noting. Yes, yeah, which is great. Um, also, like to me, I mean, this is not this is a small thing, and it's not really related to. Um, the mechanics of the game at all but like we don't get too many hd ports of naomi and dreamcast games no no and like and like I, and i've always had a specific theory that the very weird visual profile of a 3d polygonal naomi board game yeah. with its slightly lower poly count than ps2 and like slightly lower texture resolution would translate beautifully to hd remakes mm -hmm. even more so yeah. than ps2 and xbox era games do and i think i was right like this game is gorgeous yes yeah, yeah. Like, it's it's so clean and, like, boxy and, like, toy-like that I just find it visually really pleasing. Yeah. I mean, it's a silly thing to focus on, but, like, I just... I love... I love that Dreamcast-era poly count in HD. Like, crisp and clean. Mm. And it makes me, makes me pine for, like, more HD Dreamcast ports. Like, Tecromancer or Skies of Arcadia yeah. or... Yeah, that would be lovely. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, the also the sub. This is uh, part of what we talked about when we did our beat 'em up episode, right? So like the transition into polygonal presentation um, allows them to do so much more with things like scale and camera angle. Yeah. So just like when we talked about like Zombie Revenge and Dynamite Cop. You know, in these in the two D sprite based games, scale was consistent, right? Because you had to make those sprites. Yeah. But in the world of a polygonal in polygonal three D space, you can enter new scenes in Zero Gunner, and your ship might be tiny in this scene or massive in the next scene. Like it zooms in, it zooms out. The camera swings and sways and presents the enemies in new and exciting ways. So, you know, I'm always Mister Pixel Art, but like this is one of the ways that 3d games can be better yes. and more dramatic from a presentation standpoint and when that's employed in a shooter in really cool ways like it is in zero gunner it's a it's a really exciting yes yeah, so i i really like zero gunner um it's it was a, a very pleasant surprise it's obviously very different to a lot of the other stuff on these collections by the the virtue of the fact that it's um a 3d one designed for a different platform to all the others but yeah i really enjoyed it uh, I, I found the the only really sort of weak spot for it for me was the music uh which is a bit weedy but yeah it's I not mean, great it's, yeah um but aside from that it's it's a lot of fun and it's it keeps a lot of that trademark psycho feel to it while being something unique in its own right so yeah it's it's very cool yeah i was uh, i found myself playing this more than anything else on the first collection yeah but that was mainly because i had never played it before and i had played all the other oh, okay. ones before yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 it's it, it's cool and it was it was sort of a, a bit of an adjustment to have that kind of mechanics and control scheme without using a twin stick system but once you get a feel for it it's got a really really sort of pleasant feel to it it's almost like you're sort of pulling back a rubber band and twanging it to point in the different directions yeah yeah because yeah. there's a there's a trick right where like if you can get used to holding that button and then ripping in the opposite direction you can just do a full 180 instantly yeah and like that's yeah. hyper satisfying to like <laughs> annihilate everything behind you instantly like that yeah yeah it's a very satisfying game to play yeah all right well should we have a look at the bravo collection then yeah indeed because now we get to talk about Samurai Aces. Alrighty, go ahead. Yeah, so so technically, since we weren't working chronologically, right? Samurai Aces or Sengoku Ace, 1993. That was Saikyo's first game. Yeah. As first game as Saikyo. Um, and it essentially carried on the spirit of Arrow Fighters for the Geo, um, which would later also be picked up by Strikers 1945, as we discussed, which was the notion that, like, every fighter should be pretty different in terms of the way they handle and control. Um, yes. And there's actually a there's actually a character in 
Samurai Aces is a tribute to a classic character in Arrow Fighters. Yeah. So uh, Arrow Fighters, one of like the most iconic characters, is a sentient dolphin who's meant to be a genius who pilots a, <laughs> like a sentient dolphin who pilots a jet plane, and he's like talks about the fact that he's a genius all the time. So <laughs> so in Samurai Aces, there's a dog. <laughs> with it that pilots a jet plane and like none of it makes sense right because like everything else in samurai aces is like fictional aircraft that are like ancient japan like everything has like paper wings or like wood but like this dog is just in a jet (laughs) (laughs) and it's awesome (laughs) (laughs) yeah so uh even though this game came before um, Strikers 45 it had uh, secondary shots which were yes. thematically appropriate to each character which was not something that the Strikers series would adopt until the second one as we discussed um, but it's essentially the same type of game as anything else we've been talking about especially with Strikers it's got a great sense of physicality a beautiful thoughtful visual presentation with classic pixel art um, but the theme is what sets it apart. So it's a weird, speculative, fictional version of Sengoku era, classic Japan, just full of bizarre machines. And like yeah. t- tanks with Tengu masks on them and, and uh, you know, like machine guns with cranks and and just, yeah, it's, it's really, really cool. Like, uh, you know, you'll fly past, like, a dojo, and the roof will blow off it, and then, like, missile launchers will, like, transform out of it. <laughs> uh, it's just crazy fun. And, uh, you know, as we talked about when we talked about beat-em-ups, I love when we take a genre that has a very specific association. Like, I usually associate shoot-em-ups with either spaceships or, like, World War II airplanes or fighter jets. And I love when we take a genre with very specific thematic associations and make it unabashedly Japanese. Yeah. And so like, that's obviously what Sengoku Ace has done, and I appreciate the hell out of it. Yeah. Every epi- every level has a really cool mid-boss encounter with a ninja robot that like busts out of a roof somewhere. Yeah. Which is really neat. Um, and he just kind of like... I've never killed him. I'm pretty sure you can if you're much better. <laughs> if you're much better than me, but but like it's cool. He comes, he harasses you, and then he goes. And he so it's cool from like a narrative perspective where it kind of like builds the notion of this like rivalry with this like robot ninja that's in every stage. I like that a lot. Mm. Yeah, I'm 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 a big, a big fan of this game, and it's obviously it's their first game. Mechanically, it's one of the more simple ones that Psycho's put out. But I think that really benefits it because it allows you to sort of really concentrate on sort of the, the, the core mechanics and the enjoyment of shooting and dodging and these wonderful bosses and these interesting environments that you're flying over. Um, I did actually get confused. The, the, the bit I was talking about with the Buddhist statues and this big sort of monstrosity with Buddhist faces, that was actually from this game rather than uh, Dragon Blaze that I mentioned before. So oh, yeah, the river. more sense now, now that I think about it. Yeah, yeah, the river stage in this one. There um, is a river again, dragon level in Dragon Blaze. Yes, That's why I didn't correct yes, you. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. It, was, it wasn't the one I was specifically thinking of, though. But, yeah, it, it, again, this one has absolutely massive bosses, some of which that are multi-screens big, and you work your way up them and blow bits off them and that sort of thing. So, yeah, the one I was specifically thinking about and attributing to Dragon Blaze is actually in this one. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, what, what I said still stands because that's all true for Dragon Blaze as well. Yeah, but, uh, yeah that level yeah. specifically in Samurai Aces is really bizarre because, like, you're going up the river and, like, there's f- big fish coming down the river and the big fish stick their head out of the water to shoot you, but they have human baby faces. Yeah, and I'm like, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah. So, um, also important to talk about Samurai Aces is the introduction... <laughs> Of holy tomboy Miko, which would not who who would not stay a holy tomboy for long. No, 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 she would not. <laughs> um, so Samurai Aces two, nineteen ninety six, a three year gap. Uh, Samurai Aces two Teng, also known as uh. Samurai Aces 2 Tengai, which is also, I believe, Sengoku Blade in Japan. Yes, that's right. Um, is horizontal. They were like, screw this. Yeah. We're making a horizontal shmup now. 
which is cool because there's not a whole heck of a lot of these by Psycho. Just uh, mm-hmm. zero. It's just uh, Soul Divide, Samurai Aces Two, and then Samurai Aces Three is also horizontal. But the rest, you know, <clears> it's, it's vertical all the way through with everything else. Um, yeah. So uh, this is, in my opinion, the best of this series. That's a pretty widespread opinion from yeah, what I've seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's just that right sweet spot between being more mechanically complex than the original without being the heaving trash fire that three is. Um, <laughs> but but um, what to say about Samurai Aces two? Uh, every character has a very specific option related to them. So every character besides having their normal shot has a charge shot that's granted to them after you acquired one power up. Um, yeah. Those charge shots really shred the shit out of the bosses. It is super. Yes. It is super satisfying to try to stay alive long enough to keep those options for the bosses and then like really rail into them with those charge shots. Um. Yeah, definitely. Visually. Um, the animation in this game is like top notch. Like there's some really stellar parallax scrolling, which is not oh, us- yes. usually evidently present in a vertical shoot 'em up and a horizontal shoot 'em up. Specifically, I'm thinking on the ri- that early river stage. Yes, there's like eight layers to that water as it scrolls. Mm-hmm. It's it's really impressive. It's really great to look at. Um, what else about two? Uh, Miko's boobs make their grand debut. <laughs> Miko's boobs. Um, me. They're a, they are a prominent part of the intro sequence, even. They, they are. They, that's like a whole <laughs> intro sequence. It's like, um, yeah, I, I believe they start calling her Koyori in the in, in two and then in three. Like she is kind of like widely considered to be like the fan service queen of like all of Shmupdom. Yeah. <laughs> um. So that's a thing. Um. There's also an awesome, like, demon robot samurai that I'm very fond of. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it's it's just a it's just a great it's a cool game. Just continuing the interesting visual themes of the first one, but changing it to that side-scrolling perspective. And some of the scale of some of the bosses is, is, is these screen-filling, like carriages with like ninjas on the back and the like, ninjas are shooting at you and like a giant wooden skull is like cackling at you while it's firing yeah. lasers and like it's <laughs> yeah there's some really cool more subtle touches in this as well like the um this follows the the psycho format of randomizing the order of the first few levels yes um but what it does is um it changes the time of day according to the order that you do them in oh i didn't notice so, like, that so like you, the the first stage will always be sort of like middle of the day, and then the next one will be sort of sunset, and then it'll be dusk, and then it'll be nighttime, um, and that sort of coincides with um, the later you encounter a stage, it sort of ramps up the difficulty slightly as well with sort of more intense bullet patterns and so on. Okay. So that's that's a really nice subtle touch that they do in this one that uh, I'm a big fan of. They think Psycho thinks about these things, and I think that's one of yeah. the, that's one of the things that makes them so special. It's just like you would have to really pay attention to notice that i certainly didn't but when you think about how much uh from a programming and design perspective it would take to make something like that happen to to have three stages all with three different variations and difficulty bullet pattern and visual presentation is essentially nine stages but they've made nine stages and you'll only experience three of those in a given run yeah, like that's and then really multiply cool. that multiply that by seven difficulty levels as well. <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. It, it's unbelievable. Yeah. They, they do they do yeah. such a good job. Sorely, sorely will be missed. Yes. Um, anything else on two we wanted to touch on? Um, I, I just wanted to sort of reiter- re- reiterate one of the things we said about Strikers, which is this one has really interesting bomb mechanics. Oh, yes. Um, because, again, each, 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 each character's bomb in this is basically a special attack rather than a bomb. So, you, so you're not invincible while you're using a bomb in most cases. And it's um, everyone is very, very different from one another. So, for example, Miko's uh, one, she sort of hurls out a card in front of her, and that becomes like a big sort of... Um, vortex while she's shouting various things in japanese at them and it sort of continually damages anything that's caught in the blast and it blocks bullets but she's not invincible while that's happening so you still have to dodge stuff um and sort of using that effectively is all about positioning it properly 
And yeah, that's a really interesting tactical wrinkle that's in this one, in uh, specifically. Yeah, yeah. You got to get in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So Samurai Aces Three, Sengoku Cannon. Yeah. Um. I don't. I don't hate this game. I don't hate, I don't it. hate it. I don't hate it either. It's a. This is a catch twenty two. So. Mm. Samurai Aces 3 is, in my opinion, the most mechanically rich and satisfying <laughs> yes. Psycho game. Yes. It's, it's specific mechanics in terms of shot, scoring, and combat are my favorite. Mm -hmm. It is just hideous and, <laughs> and cheap, cheaply made and not and when I say cheaply made, like I like a lot of cheaply made games. I love Idea Factory. But it's also like what I would call cynically made. Like it feels, mm -hmm. it feels like a cash grab. It feels like it was made on the cheap to make some money without a whole heck of a lot of thought put into it. And that, and that's why I don't care much for it because, mm -hmm. uh, while well, though I think it's mechanically delightful, I don't think it does enough with those mechanics. It doesn't present. Yeah. For instance, a lot of the bosses are super boring. A lot of the mm -hmm. bosses are just like other humans that you fight with, like deep bullet hell patterns instead instead yeah. of like instead it has none of like the bombast and like beautiful visual presentation that the other two Sengoku aces games had um part of that is due to the fact this was a psp game yes so really really low poly count backgrounds but it's not just that because they're just drab they're, yeah. they're not yeah. beautifully made they're not they're boring to look at like nothing in this game is really fun or attractive to look at and and for me that's a problem because i engage with shooters almost primarily because i love the act of design enemy yes. enemy design stage design um so this game leaves a lot to be desired for me uh, from a visual perspective and so i i tend to be disappointed by it mechanically though it's super rich I, I know you're better at talking about that stuff than i am from a yeah, scoring so, perspective but this game's got it going on yeah so basically what you have in this is again you've got a selection of characters who have each got their own unique shot patterns um but in this way you can attack in four different ways so you've got your standard shot uh which you you, you fire out with just like the the auto fire button as in the other ones um you've got a cave style laser shot that again is implemented slightly differently from character to character so for example miko's quote unquote laser is just her firing really quickly whereas one of the other characters she actually fires out an actual laser beam in front of her um then you've got the uh their bombs which again are mechanically unique to each character and again miko's got like the the this sort of um energy field that she can shoot out and the other characters can do different things one of them's got homing shots and that sort of thing um the bombs are noteworthy in that you can miss with them um which is not something i'm used to in, <laughs> in a shoot 'em up but like um like the main protagonist guy uh masamut so his his bomb is like a, a barrage of homing shots uh but the way they fire if you fire them too close to an enemy you will miss <laughs> yeah because they kind of come <laughs> around him not yeah not like through him yeah yeah and, and and so that's that's something you have to bear in mind that i've not seen before that which is really interesting um but the the, the sort of the sort of main mechanical wrinkle in uh, samurai aces 3 uh, is is where it draws its subtitle from which is sengoku cannon so you have this um this special attack called the cannon attack um and it's a powerful shot that you can't rapid fire there's, there's sort of like a, a cooldown of like a second or two between each 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 time you can fire it but otherwise there's no limits on it and it's a very powerful shot um, so you can damage things very quickly with the cannon, um, but it ties in very much with the scoring system. So what happens is if you if you kill an enemy with the cannon, uh, you will get a score multiplier of up to 10 times the enemy's normal value, depending on how much you overkilled them by, basically. Um, and also, any bullets that that enemy fired uh, will be cancelled and turned into coins that will give you additional points. Um, and so what you have to do in order to score effectively in Samurai Aces 3 is you have to damage an enemy as much as possible and then finish them off with the cannon to get the maximum multiplier and also try and time this so it's when they've got the maximum possible number of bullets on screen as well. So there's a lot of things to think about but it does sort of add a few things to the game 
uh, to help you with that as well. Like, for example, there's a little bar in the corner of the screen that, like in a beat em up, you have um, a health bar for the enemies that you're you, that you're wailing on. In most cases, like Capcom and Streets of Rage, they do that a lot. Um, in this, enemies have health bars, so you can see how much damage you've done to them and when is going to be the best time to fire off that cannon shot and hopefully get that big bonus. Um, yeah, but the wrinkle to that is if you hit an enemy with more than one cannon shot, um, then you get none of those bonuses at all, even if you finish them off with the cannon. Uh, and so boss fights in particular, yes, you can clear a boss fight very easily by just hurling cannon shots at them in gaps in their bullet pattern, but if you want to get the best possible score for them, you want to damage each of their phases' health bars with your shot and your laser attacks, and then fire off a perfectly timed cannon shot at the end, so you can get that 10 times score bonus, cancel the bullet pattern they've got on the screen at once, and get the maximum possible score from them. So yeah, there's a ton of interesting mechanical depth to this game. I just want um, them to be in a better game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, it's it's worth noting that a lot of the sort of things that people don't like about this game carry across to the Switch port. So, like, the Switch port is almost too good a port in that it carries across the low poly backgrounds. It carries across the low frame rate of the PSP version mm -hmm. as well, which is pro probably the the thing that people struggle the most with. I mean, the frame rate the frame rate is about thirty. I think um, most shooters run at about sixty, and frame rate is important in shooters it's not something i tend to care about a lot but frame rate is important with shoot 'em ups sure it's worth noting that the the actual sort of controls and responsiveness of samurai aces 3 is is fine it's just the fact that it it, it doesn't run at a very good frame rate so it's difficult to be as precise as you could be with a shoot 'em up that is running at a faster pace and it's it's a bit of a shame that they didn't um optimize the switch version so that it could run at 60 frames a second um but i guess that doing that because of the way the game was designed the only thing i can assume is that i would have thrown things like the timing and stuff off this game was designed to run at that frame rate and if you change that frame rate it's going imagine to playing this on the psp yeah yeah i have yes it. i have it it's a we it's a weird time <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's just very strange to me, like the the notion of like handhelds that are developed for the PSP, yeah. <laughs> like exclusively. <laughs> yeah. No, it's weird. I I know this game isn't isn't very well regarded, and like there's there's good reason for that. But I didn't have a terrible time with it. I I, I enjoyed it, but oh, it's yeah. not awful. Te yeah, but yeah, Ten Guy is much better as as a horizontal scrolling samurai aces game. Ten Guy is is way better. Well, the, you know the problem the problem with Sengoku Canon is that like it's a cheeseburger. It's the cheeseburger and the pile of steaks. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. You, you know, you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it's totally cool and fun, and it's a fun shoot 'em up. But just like every other game Psycho has ever made has been so much better. Yeah, <laughs> that it's it's really difficult to get behind this game because it's just such a dip. I mean, technically, this wasn't even made by Psycho. Yeah, this was an Exynos game, wasn't yeah. it? So that's like the pass it gets. Yeah. Ah, but that's the that's the Samurai Aces. So we've got three more games. The, we've got the Gun series. Mm -hmm. Now I know you have really taken a shining to Gunbird. Mm -hmm. The first Gunbird. What is it you love so much about Gunbird? Um, I just. It's just for me. It's it's a lot of those things that I really like about Psycho games. So it's it's got that sense of physicality to the weapons. Mm -hmm. It's got interesting variety to the characters. Like they 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 leaned very hard on like the secondary attacks in this one. Yes. Um, with every character having very very distinctive secondary attacks, like with the, some having homing shots, some having the missiles, some having all sorts of different things. Um. And it's just got a really nice sort of sense of personality and atmosphere to it. Like it feels like you're playing a '90s anime. Yeah, I think the I think I like Gunbird so much too because just like thematically, it's like the goofy anime one. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, like your your characters are like a witch. There's a, a cool like Legend of the Monkey King inspired girl, a quote unquote stubborn old carpenter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> An adventurer just in a rocket pack with a ray gun. Like, 
it's really uh it's just like the goofy fun anime one yeah and i think i think one thing that really helps with gunbird as well is there's i i mean psycho backgrounds are, are generally pretty good i mean i mean even even strikers 2 with its muddy backgrounds the, the actual sort of level of detail there is, oh it's is insane but but gunbird really takes this to a whole other level like there's the the main sort of villains that you're fighting off for the for the majority of the game there's there's three of them and in every level you can see them running around on the ground doing stuff yeah scrambling around to like harass you and like climb into yeah. new machines and stuff yeah and like sort of the the climax of each level is is always a fight with one of them in in whatever their latest and greatest new weapon that they've picked up is and like between the different phases of the boss battle you see them sort of running away in a panic and trying to get into the giant robot that inevitably burst out the front of the train and that sort of thing so yeah it's fantastic yeah, yeah it is it is it is i think if, based on based on the knowledge that i've acquired from these games so far it is the quintessential psycho game i think so yeah i would i would not argue with that one th hmm. uh, one complaint i have about gunbird one is why do the charge attacks take so long to charge? <laughs> yeah. They take a really long time to charge. But, yeah. but, 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 dear God, that sound effect when they're ready is so satisfying. Oh, I, I tell you what, this is the other thing I like about Gunbird. Gunbird has my favorite explosion sounds I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> they're good. There's, there's just some... There's just something incredibly satisfying about the specific sound quality that they've used and the sample rate and just the sound of the explosions. It's just, they're just the perfect crunchy explosion sounds that are just like, every time I blow something up, it's just like, yes, yes, more of this. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's so satisfying. And two just mm. continued that, like more and better. Yeah. Um, I was really disappointed that the version we got of 2 was the original arcade version and not the Dreamcast version. Oh, okay. What were the differences then? Uh, Dreamcast version had two more playable characters. Okay. Uh, Dreamcast version had um, this guest character Ayn from the Sengoku Aces, the samurai guy. Oh, yes. And, yeah. and Morrigan from Darkstalkers. Oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, yes. so like I was really sad that um, you know we just got the straight. I mean, it's still an amazing game, but like I used yeah. to really like playing as Morrigan. Um, yeah, I assume that would have been a licensing thing then. Yeah, it totally would have. Uh, so, yeah. um, Gunbird Two came out in 99, 98, a year before mm -hmm. Strikers Three, uh, and so Gunbird Two actually invented the metal chaining system. Yeah, that that you would later see in Strikers Three. Um, in terms of like mechanical improvements, the charge shots don't take as long to charge, so I <laughs> so I appreciate that. But but the charge shots are free in Gunbird. The charge shots use the same build and spend system as Strikers Two in Gunbird Two. Right. So yeah. you're limited to how much you can use them, and you have to earn them. Yeah. So that's a big difference. Uh, you can't abuse them, but they take quicker to charge. So. Uh, also, every character has a melee attack uh, in Gunbird 2, but, 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 it uses the same bar as your charge shot, so you actually have, oh, to, make, okay. you have to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, there. Otherwise, it's just more of the same charm of Gunbird 1, right? It's the goofy anime one, with cr like, massively detailed backgrounds, with loads of animation, things going on. It's kind of what we talked about a bit when we talked about uh, how beautiful the Denjin Makai beat em ups are in that the the backgrounds are so alive that they feel lived in. They don't yeah, just feel yeah. like these spaces you're moving through, but they feel like real places, like storefronts with people on them, uh, water, like the uh, canal with boats moving through it. It's it's just all very alive, um, which yeah. which I really appreciate as someone who looks for little details. And the characters are cool. There's a a hmm. witch, a robot. Uh, Alucard, not like Castlevania Alucard, but like <laughs> also a vampire who is named Alucard. Um, the daughter of the Rocket Pack toting explorer from the first one. Um, and a genie. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. It just, it's just goofy and fun. 
So I really, I really like this game. I mean, I obsessively played Gunbird 2 on the Dreamcast back in the day. Mm-hmm. Like every day before school, when I was in like high school, I would play it. Like just to like clear my head. Like love it. Love this game. Yeah, yeah. This this is one that I've not spent a huge amount of time with yet, but it's it's sort of next on my list to cover. So. I've I've sort of been saving it for last because I know it's it's one of the most well regarded psycho ones out there. So yeah, yeah, I've been I've been, I've been waiting for this one. Yeah, it will it will please you. It's just more of the same, uh, you know, just 1998 shooting perfection. <laughs> so essentially, yep. like, this is this is like you know as we reach the end of the 90s, like this genre like crystallized right like into yeah. like this perfect thing, and like Unbird yeah. Two is really just a prime example of like the best of the best of the best that the genre had to offer in that time period yeah uh, which leaves us with one more title to discuss which is gun i love this game gun Barrick. i love this game so much <laughs> how could you not how could you not <laughs> it's not a shoot 'em up but it is an arkanoid clone with shoot 'em up elements and pinball and get the pinball <laughs> and pinball and pinball <laughs> yeah so, my friends, have you ever wondered, asked the question, what if Arkanoid, but your, but your, your, your thing that you reflected the ball with also had pinball flippers, which allowed <laughs> you to hit the ball at different angles and or reflect enemy shots back at them? Yes. That's oh, so good. that's Gun Barrack. Um, really interesting. Um, so uh, there are enemies that shoot at you. If you don't catch and counter their shots, they essentially stay on the bottom of the screen as mines that paralyze you when you touch them. And then you yeah. have to jiggle the controller to get out of that hold. So besides actually trying to catch your ball every time, because just like any Arkanoid or Breakout style game, you'll die if you miss the ball... You also have to catch the enemy shots because they'll prevent you from doing a good job catching your ball later. So you've got to have like full awareness of the entire space. It's really challenging. Yeah, yeah. And then there's uh, all the usual sort of Arkanoid style power ups in there as well that sort of affect the size of your. I don't know what you'd even call it in Gun Barrack, but your paddle, your flippers, or whatever. Yeah. And there's. Um, pretty intense multi-ball mode um Lucky. That is just yeah. ab- ab- absolute chaos <laughs> oh i lose it i lose I, I i dread the multi-ball because I, I die almost every time i get the multi-ball <laughs> i mean yes they color code your ball as pink and all the other balls are blue but like my god do i die every time i get the multi-ball like yeah like clockwork it's also the whole thing's on a time attack too. So as if it wasn't stressful yes. enough, you can't like take your time and be careful. Yeah, yeah, it's bonkers, absolutely bonkers. But yeah, I I, I love it. What, what's what's the background of this one? I, I haven't really looked into it yet. But where where did this one come from? Was this was this an arcade game or a console game or? <sighs> I'm pretty sure this was Dreamcast era. I think this was Naomi yeah. hardware. Um, because it was pretty much one of the last Psycho developed Psycho games. Yeah. Um, but I don't know a lot about it. I had honestly never even heard of it until these collections started coming out. I I remember seeing it when they released because they released all these games separately on the eShop for Switch right. before they did these compilations, and I remember seeing it there and thinking, "Oh, that looks like fun," and and then not downloading it, but um. Yeah, that was the first time I'd, I'd encountered it. Um, there's very limited information on this online from the look of things. All I can yeah. find is there's, there's a, uh, a Wikia fandom site that says it was originally released for arcades in 2001. Yeah, it looks like the Switch um, port is the first home port of it. Yeah. The arcades. And then, yeah. So I was wrong. It wasn't on the Dreamcast. Yeah. But it's cool. Yeah, I love it. it yeah, and it's, it's really uh, I'm different. glad they included I this didn't, as well. So it's, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't because uh, hmm. I, as I said, I'd never heard of it until these these collections started coming out. I just knew that it had Marion from Gunbird in it, so I just assumed it was essentially a slightly cutesier Gunbird three. Essentially, I had no idea it was something totally different. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that is the uh, Psycho Collections. Uh, really, yes. really delightful 
historical retrospective on a really talented developer. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really pleased that they've they've got such a nice release as well. Like the the versions that that um, Nice America have put out. Oh, all those yes, is, holy is just shit, are those beautiful packages. Because you've got you've got the you've got the the switch game in there and then you've got a, a three cd soundtrack covering all of the music from all of the games yeah they're complete soundtracks they're not yes and let's just say too the music in the strikers games yeah my god <laughs> <laughs> it's like dynasty warriors quality just like blazing electric guitars and like i can defeat this situation <laughs> like it's so pleasant <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, so I mean these are great collections and I'm just so happy that like historically we can own them and and be able to reflect back on them. Um my dream is for something like this to be done with Rising. Mm. Um yes. Cuz they're my favorite. They're my favorite shooter house of this era. And I would give mm -hmm. anything to have a preserved copy of Armed Police Batrider that I don't have to pay $200 for. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah thank goodness these exist um so like your 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 impressions are you now officially a psycho fan <laughs> definitely definitely 100 percent. i mean i i had a feeling i would be but yeah i'm i'm really really impressed i i've not had a bad time with any of these games at all i've i, I really enjoy all of them so yeah the only trouble i have now is when i want to sit down with the shooter map which one of these do i pick <laughs> yeah it's 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 really tough it's really tough but they're all they're all just fantastic and the the amount of replay value in each of them is so tremendous because as i keep harping yes. home most of these are focused on develop and developed around the notion that every single character is radically different in unique ways so yeah every one of yeah. these games is like five games <laughs> yeah yeah and then add in the difficulty levels and the second loops and the different orders you can play the stages in. And um, oh, one thing I did want to highlight about these Switch ports is that we we were talking about it in the beat em up episode, but the, the matter of credit feeding. One thing I really appreciate about these collections is the fact that you can you can choose how you want to handle continues. Like you yes. can completely turn off continues altogether if you want to, or you can have unlimited continues, or you can give yourself two continues. And it's yeah, that's that for me is the perfect way of handling home ports like this it's great it's great yeah, yeah. as opposed to like i like i i just meant like i love aiding um and rising and um and i have i'm lucky to have gotten the limited run pressing of uh, battle garega but i don't really yeah. like the way that was handled because it has a continue unlock system so right. like if i want to play it credit fee just to like see it and relax with it like i can't do it yet i have to like play it for a couple more hours to unlock yeah more continues like the way these ports handle it just with an option it, it's really the yeah. best for this yeah yeah um, definitely also yes. i think one last thing that needs to be mentioned is how delicious the uh translation is <laughs> on these like we haven't mentioned that at all like like it, it's a, it's especially delightful in gun barrack because it's like trying to explain to you how to play the game but i don't understand what it's telling me to do at all <laughs> it's it's like if you catch the packs with flipper rotate packs to enjoy the control <laughs> yes. i'm just like yes english <laughs> Yeah, so that oh, that's all. Wonderful. That's a fun. It's a fun treat. Like the interstage, like dialogue for a lot of like the Samurai Aces games and Dragon Blaze. It's like, yeah. like I am not trying to find special item. I am looking for brothers. Like excla <laughs> like exclamation. Yeah. <laughs> it's an extra yes. extra bit of fun in a package that is already full of delights. Yes, definitely. It's, it's worth noting as well that uh, a lot of those ones that do incorporate a bit of narrative to them, they have lots of endings as well. Yes. Like Samurai Aces has has 22 endings, depending on which character you pick, if you're playing two-player, and which combination of characters you're playing yeah. as, if you're playing two-player. Yeah, Gunbird's the same <laughs> way. Gun, Gunbird 2, at least, yeah. is the same way. Yeah. I miss the the, the, yes. the Morrigan endings in a Dreamcast one where all just like whoever you were with she was being mean to. It was <laughs> just fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> or like finding a way to like steal from and manipulate them. Yeah, always a good time. Yeah. All right. So that's that.
All right, good stuff. Okay, let's finish in the usual way then. So, do you want to tell people where to find you online? Absolutely. Uh, you can always see my artwork at mrgilderpixels.com, uh, and I'm always posting work in progress shots and uh, pictures of my new game acquisitions and whatnot on my uh, Instagram, which is also mrgilderpixels. Good stuff. And you can find my writing most days on mariagamer.net. And you can find my YouTube channel, which you may already be watching this on, at youtube.com slash C slash Pete Davison. Uh, and there you'll find um, Atari A to Z series. I've done over 220 of those now. I, I counted the other day. That's, That's unreal. Of those. Yeah. Um, and also uh, currently playing through the Final Fantasy Marathon. Uh, and we're, we're finishing off our current playthrough of uh, Warriors All-Stars as well. And then Warriors, Warriors Wednesday is going to take a bit of a break after that. Uh, possibly permanently. I haven't decided yet. But uh, oh, come on, I, man. I, Where's your backbone? Oh, Our Oro I need a Orochi, bit of time back. Orochi 4 <laughs> Ultimate's out. <laughs> I'm, I'm still I'm still going to play the Warriors games and probably write about them, but uh, making a video a week for it is uh, is starting to prove a bit exhausting. So it may well be back at some point. But well, Pete, uh, they're all the we, same. We game. shall see. We shall see. We shall see. Anyway, um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Moe Gamer, and you can find me on Instagram at Moe Gamer Pete. Uh, uh, posting a bit more stuff on there now, so you can follow me there if you want to. If not, don't. Um, and yeah. Just remains for us to say, as always, thank you very much for watching and or listening, and we'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. Be sure to check out moegamer.net for new articles on Japanese and Japanese inspired video games, new and old, every weekday. Every month, Moegamer features an in depth exploration of an individual game or series as its cover game, so be sure to check the archives to see if your favourite has had a deep dive yet. If you'd like to support the site directly, please consider becoming a patron or buying me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.